This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 658, recorded on August 28th, 2020. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from New York State, Daniel Griffin. Hello, everyone. Back to work, Daniel? Uh, yes, yes. You know, it was really nice getting that week off, sort of off, as we discussed. But uh, Yeah, sort of. You know, yeah. yeah back, well, I did the same in. thing this week. I'm supposed to be off, but I'm, I've done four or five podcasts this week. Various committee meetings, uh, you know, nothing changes. You're right. Well, the podcasts are great. So keep, keep, you know, keep doing those. That's when I'm not on the podcast. I'm listening to everyone <laughs> else on the podcast. So they are great. You know, it's a source of some reliable sound scientific discussion in the midst of uh, what can often be frustrating times. Did you see Twiv made the New York Times this week? Uh, you were one of those podcasts where uh, we had ungagged Tony Fauci. That's right. It was pretty funny. Yeah, <laughs> it was good. That's great. Yeah, you know, it's it's interesting, right? Um, a lot of people listen. Not only do a lot of people listen to TWIV when you look at the numbers, but as you and I have heard from listeners, there's a lot of physician groups where they designate someone to listen to TWIV, and then that person then disseminates it to the rest of the group. So. Yep, yep. But I still get those emails now and then from a physician who says, can you just make some bullet points and send them to me? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, that that's my job. So let me start with the bullet points. Let's get right to it. Um, so uh, I, I'm going to start with a um, with a interesting. This is a different quotation. This is a quotation from a gentleman that people may not know. Someone called Joe and Lai. And uh, you know, there's a lot of times there's a quotation out there and it gets attributed to someone else. Um, and this this is usually attributed to Mao Zedong, right? The famous uh, Chinese uh, leader. I use the word leader. Um, and he, and the the story was that this individual was asked in the 1900s what he thought about the significance of the French Revolution that had happened, you know, a couple hundred years before. And his uh, translated quotation was, "It's a little too soon to say." <laughs> <laughs> so we're we're in a rush right now. I think we're all in a rush. Like we want to know, like what's the big headline of of the week? What does that mean? And so um, a couple times today, as we go through this, I'm gonna uh, get back to this quotation and say, you know what? It's a little too soon to say. So let's uh, let's go through this. A few big headlines this week. A um, few documented cases of people getting. Um, COVID a second time with a genetically distinct second viral isolate. We'll talk a little bit about that. The FDA approval of convalescent plasma for expanded use. Talk about the shock. Um, and a change in the CDC testing guidance. So, um, But let, let's start with a, a few of these before we get into the meat of the other things I want to talk about. Um, the, the reports of documented second infections and infection um, with a genetically distinct strain. And, you know, these reports are not unexpected, nor are they, quote unquote, game changers based on what we know about, you know, other coronaviruses based upon what we were starting to um, think we were seeing. Um, and it really, if anything, it just reminds us of the critical unanswered questions, which, which still are the same. Um, you know, one, what percent of people get infected more than once? And, you know, if, if it's three people, that's great. If it's 100 people, that's still, you know, absolutely acceptable. Is it the majority? Is this an exception or will it be common after, say, a year? We, we don't know. And again, um, it's still too early to say still too soon to say um, the second. And I think this will be interesting. Um, is is the second time less or more severe, and that then and does that depend on the time from first infection to second infection? So again, we're we're, we're not going to know this anytime soon. Um, third, are second time infected people capable of transmitting the virus? Right. So if they get it, can they then spread it? So is there a low level of virus that we can pick up, or is this a high level? And we're now talking about the concept of infectious levels of RNA, infectious levels of virus. So we don't know that. 
And then if second time infected people can spread the disease, we don't know that yet. Um, again, does that depend on the time from the first infection? Is there something we can tell about antibody levels? Is there some quantity of RNA testing that can help us with these individuals? But um, the only thing we can take, I say from these reports that people should stop saying you can't get reinfected. Um, and start trying to figure out the the dynamics of this. Um, but, you know, this brings us back to our quotation. It's too soon to say what this really means. And we'll see. This is not a time for panic. This doesn't um, mean that, you know, the sky is going to fall. Um, you know, it's just something, something more information we've got. Um, We'll touch on plasma a little bit later because I'm gonna I'm gonna put that into our discussion of therapeutics. Um, and, and don't worry, the testing part we're gonna spend plenty of time on testing, right? We're we're in the post um, Michael Mina <laughs> phase of TWIV, as some of our uh, of the epoch of TWIV, as some of our listeners have pointed out. So uh, let's let's go to the points that I like to hit each time. So one, case numbers, deaths, um, morbidity, what's going on? Um, now we're starting to see a shift in cases um, and a rise in school age children um, that are are now. Um, RNA positive. Um, and this sort of is going along with a lot of the reopening. Um, and I'm not surprising. I, I, there, was a, there was a CDC comment I saw a few weeks back, which um, the CDC suggested that maybe the fact that the schools were closed, and the kids were out of school may have been related to the low number of infections we saw in children. And I was kind of like, really? <laughs> Who would have thought? <laughs> so yeah, you shut down the schools, you keep the kids at home, you don't expose them to the virus. And yeah, I, I, I'm kind of on board with the CDC. <laughs> I think that may explain things. Um, but one of the sort of things that came out recently was, uh, you know, a lot of people are asked, like, you know, the number of deaths, how do you feel about that? Acceptable, unacceptable. You know, over a thousand U.S. healthcare workers have already died of COVID-19. Um, and I, as I think I mentioned on previous um, TWIBs right now, um, actually a colleague of mine who's one of our OR assistants is actually in the hospital. She's in her second month in the ICU. Um, she's super sick. Uh, her lungs are full of all that proteinaceous and cellular debris. She's got all these um, cavities that are forming. She's got staph aureus in the blood. I mean, um, this is this is tragic. Um, you know, one death is too many. And so um, let's go to number two, transmission testing and schools. Um, and I'm going to talk about testing again and again, <laughs> but I just want to make sure uh, people understand I'm not doing all this, this work um, alone. And my colleagues at United Health Group um, Research and Development, so Ethan Burke, Stephen Catani, Doreen Volta, many others are really working on this um, to try to get testing capacity to expand. Um, our goal is even in more... Um, I think ambitious than yours, Vincent, a, a dollar a day, I, I think is too much. <laughs> I want to see it less. You know, I did the math. They said, well, you know, 400 million, you know, we test five times a week. That's 2 billion a week. That's 100 billion a year. Um, I want to bring that down. Let's, let's, let's really uh, test ourselves out of this if we can. Um, you know, we have therapeutics, we have vaccines, we have public health measures, we have education. TWIV is part of that, um, but we also have testing. So a couple of the questions that we're focusing on as we're, we're pushing forward with testing is what, what do we do with the, with the results of these tests? And part of it is at what level of RNA is a person infectious? And th this actually relates to an interesting question and discussion that uh, came up recently was that if you have a negative test, do you still need to wear a mask? If someone has a negative test, do you still want them to wear a mask around you? So um, a critical question with this new testing paradigm of identifying infectious people and moving away from just diagnostic testing is at what level of RNA is a person actually infectious? Um, and so we're getting a little more sophisticated than just the concept of sensitivity to the concept of sensitivity at a particular level of RNA or equivalent antigen. So, you know, one approach, and this was the approach we still have in certain quarters, is a zero tolerance. And we're trying to move past what I think is a misconception. You know, someone who has below a certain level, who's, you know, 100 days out, and we can only pick them up, you know, the sophisticated test at about 100 pieces of RNA. Um, I think there's pretty good consensus that the chance that that person can spread this is not significant. So, the two approaches that we've been looking at in trying to determine infectiousness relative to RNA levels, this is important for a lot of our clinicians listening, um, 
is one, you can basically say, well, can I culture virus from this person? And then the second is what about contact tracing? And if we look at people with different levels of virus, are we seeing that they're transmitting um, or not? Um, you know, and I think that a lot of our early studies, and I'm going to switch over to my quote unquote white paper that we're putting together at, at United Health Group, is that, you know, a couple of the early studies out of China um, really did a pretty good job of establishing a CT, a cycle threshold value of 24 or an RNA copy number of about 3 million as really the cutoff um, at which really are not going to do uh, much as far as getting culture in your, your Vero cells. Um, when that study came out, um, Taiwan, there was another about out of Hong Kong, you know, still in the same range, about a million RNA copies um, per ml, um, really below that, um, your ability to culture with any reliability starts to vanish. Um, there have been a few studies where you can, I think we're getting a little better at this, um, you know, when you get to those people with very small amounts, so CT values of greater than 35, there was one study where about 8% of the samples, you could culture it out. So, I mean, I think we're kind of rising, you know, we're sort of arriving back at where we started here. It looks like people who are in the millions are the ones who are, are spreading the virus. Once you get to these lower numbers, you know, you're, you know, nothing's 100%. I think, except for death, uh, saying I was going to say taxes, but I think there's some famous criminal who he didn't pay his taxes, went to prison instead. So, uh, you know, um, the other that we've been looking at quite a bit is where do you get that sample? Because um, even though we talk about the middle turbinate, that deep brain biopsy where we stick the Q-tip back, um, most people probably are aware that um, a large number of the, the collection centers have moved away from that and they're doing the anterior nary, sticking it just inside the nostril, swirling it around um, three times on each side. I just had this done yesterday to both my nostrils. It, it tickles. It's like someone putting a feather up there. Um, and when you do that, the level of RNA in the front of the nose there um, is, is lower than it is, you know, deep in at that middle turbinate, that deep nasopharyngeal swab. It's about three cycles on your, on your PCRs, which is two to the third or two times two times two. So about eight times less. Um, so that's important when we think about our assays, but that, that's not a huge issue with most of our assays. Um, saliva, really, let's be honest. Um, saliva is non-invasive. Um, it's a much better and it's more amenable to frequent testing. Um, and it may be about the same amount of RNA per milliliter that you get from saliva that you get from these um, deep swabs. So that, that might be a great way to go. And so um, there's a lot of uh, push going in that direction. Um, <clears throat> here's something, and, and this was on TWIV last time I was listening. Actually, TWIV back to. Um, last TWIV was fantastic, I want to say, but all the TWIVs are very good. And this was a question about, oh, you know, false positives. Is that an issue or not? And that actually, that is an issue. And that's been an issue for us for a while. Um, you know, and as you start doing lots and lots of testing with a low pretest probability, um, most of those positives you pick up when you're looking at someone who's in an area, we'll say New York, with a low prevalence, they have no symptoms, they're coming in for screening. Um, even if your test is really, um, really specific, a 1% um, specificity, so a 99% specificity or a 1% of the time um, that you're going to get someone who's positive or not, that's really going to translate into a lot of numbers when you start testing. So 500 individuals, that's five a day are going to come up positive. Um, and we're doing testing now for Lionsgate, Netflix, a lot of the schools in the area, a lot of businesses. Um, so we're getting multiple positives a day. Most of those are false positives. So this will bring people back to the concept of rapid orthogonal testing. So even if you do a platform that's a PCR, a template-mediated amplification, a Abbott ID now, um, if it comes back positive, most of those are not going to really be positive. So what we're doing, um, our protocol at the ProHealth um, Testinator sites, um, is to do another test, and only if that second test is positive to report it as a true positive. So we consider... Yep. Daniel, if you're, yep. is a false positive ever a low CT value or, or is it always a high CT value? So the false positives, um, you know, and, and this is something interesting. I'll say that uh, um, Anthony Fauci brought up. He said, oh, you could just call up the lab and find out that CT value. So I think as we've discussed, that's not true. 
Um, <laughs> most actually, most of the machines, right? The whole Logic Panther TMA machine, it's really in wide use. It's high throughput. It's much more rapid than the CDC modified. There's no ability to get a CT value out of those because you just at 40 cycles, you look, is it positive or negative? Um, so what I'll actually say is a lot of those false positives are not a problem with the person. They're not even a question of RNA levels. It's just a question with the, the way the assay is set up. So I'll, I'm going to say, since most of those are false positives, um, those, those are basically zero RNA. So these are not, not that you're picking up low levels. You're just, um, so yeah, so we, we have this on a regular basis and, um, you know, we test a second time and actually early on, we were testing a third time. We sort of said, yeah, we don't need to do that. Um, but yeah, a false positive followed by a negative that trumps it. That's a negative. It's not. And we've even moved away from using the concept of a false positive and saying a initial, you know, positive result on a machine is indeterminate until confirmed. And this is just the wonderful um, uh, utility of rapid um, testing. So that if someone has what we're concerned about, you can quickly um, verify what that really means. So or rapid orthogonal testing to sort that out. Um, don't, don't panic because it's always frightening to have a positive test and there's lots of implications. So this scenario of screening low risk asymptomatic individuals, you've got to have a plan in place to take those quote unquote indeterminants and um, find out is that, a, is that a positive or actually a technical issue that's actually a truly negative uh, test on second run. Uh, so why don't we just rapid test everyone? Well, just to, to let everyone know, because this is a question. Um, you know, some of our systems allow us to take a thousand samples and run them through in 90 minutes. So thousand, 90 minutes. Um, so some of our scenarios, particularly for um, the entertainment industry, is we crank those through um, every evening. And then the next morning, we can bring a person in and, and see before they go to work, um, you know, if that's truly someone we need to worry about. Uh, where do we get the sample? I'm just going to hit this again. It matters where you get that sample. Um, and a lot of us are trying to move down to saliva because saliva, saliva is less invasive. And if we're going to test more and more often, we need something that people are comfortable doing every day. Um, now, the CDC updated guidance. Um, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to interpret this. <laughs> so. Um, I, I recommend everyone go to the page, you know, and there actually is an overview of testing for SARS-CoV-2 um, and revisions were made on August 24th. And actually, I have to say, you know, Red, Redfield came out with some comments on this and uh, he, he actually interpreted this. I'm going to I'm going to suggest the same way I'm interpreting this. Um, I think people are using testing and by people, I, I'm going to say patients are often using testing um, improperly. And testing is a little bit sophisticated. Um, TWIV listeners are probably shaking their heads. If you listen to TWIV, you got it. But if you don't listen to TWIV, um, tell your friends. Um, and what, what we found people do is they go somewhere. They have what is maybe a high-risk exposure. They come from a hot state, et cetera. And then they immediately, the next day, go get a test. It's negative, And they say, oh, I'm all clear. And I'm, I'm done. And and what Redfield said in his statement was, we're not saying that people who need testing shouldn't get tested. We're just saying just because a person wants a test doesn't mean they should get tested. And, and that's really um, what I think, you know, if you go through each one of these steps, um, you know, when they talk about who should and shouldn't be tested, um, what they try to point out is a couple things. One is what's really important is the incubation period. And I, and I've brought this up before. My wife claims the 14 day incubation period of SARS-CoV-2 is excessive. And, and that's just the biology. Um, so it's, it's not me. If you get exposed to someone who has, um, COVID-19, who is shedding virus, your um, you know, not properly protected. So you're within six feet of them for greater than 15 minutes. Um, and they have, we'll say, infectious level of virus greater than a million. Um, you have about a 50-50 chance of getting infected from, from what we've seen in the studies. That's 50-50. It's not 100%. Um, if the virus is lower, that's going to help you. If the virus is higher, that's not going to help you. Um, we know certain individuals, when they speak, breathe, talk, and sing, there's a bit more spray. The super spreading in part might be due to that. Um, those individuals put you at higher risk. But you might at any time between 
that encounter and 14 days out um, become sick or not become sick, but become infected. So <clears throat> the timing of that testing should be guided, um, I'll say by someone who understands testing. Don't feel, um, and I see this way too many times, that you can get a negative test and this predicts the future. That's a negative test right then. You know What you need to do is you need to quarantine for those 14 days. A negative test does not change the biology of the incubation period. So the way I'm looking at this testing is I'm, I'm saying that those tests that people run and get on Monday because they found out they were at that party on Saturday exposed to someone, those you don't need. What you need is a test at an appropriate endpoint, and that should be guided by someone who understands testing. So, so my my review of the uh, CDC guidelines is that we need more appropriate testing. We need more testing. We don't need less testing. Well, it would have been nice if they had made it clear <laughs> right from the beginning, and uh, there wasn't this implication that the White House was involved in wanting fewer tests to make it look better for them, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I think that's why they asked us to discuss it on TWIV, right? Did, yes. did you get the request from Redfield? <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, let's let's yeah let's let's continue to test our way out of this as much as we can. But uh, Daniel, if we had yeah. a one dollar antigen saliva test, which you could do every day, you could test as much as you wanted, right? You could test yeah. on Monday after the party, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Friday, boom, you're positive. Then you got to quarantine, right? That would help. You know, and, and that actually, that really goes back to to the point here, right? Is that we say people get sick two to 14 days afterwards, right? But if people are starting to get sick two days afterwards, some people are starting to shed virus that next day really early. So the only reason that the CDC is, um, in my mind, from a scientific point of view, talking about limiting inappropriate testing, as they, you might say that, is that if you if there's a finite number of tests if people don't have access if you're getting a test interferes with uh, you know creates a resulting delay but no if we've got access if everyone's doing a test every day and you're getting a test every day doesn't mean someone else can't get a test yeah, every day yeah, that's yeah. fair yeah. i think you're that's the problem is that at the moment the cdc and fda are thinking about pcr tests whereas antigen screening is really different and we're not there yet right Exactly. I mean, we're getting we're getting close, right? We are we are pushing this hard, um, and we'll you know we'll I guess I'll just mention we're pushing this hard in the you know quote unquote the tri-state testinator program, which I was um, I was doing some media appearances this week. I was actually in Brooklyn yesterday morning, and it was you know they've got the bouquet of the of the microphones, and then there's like a semicircle of all the cameras. So um, I think I was you know on I think eight different, seven or eight different channels. So all my patients this morning were like, Dr. Griffin, I saw you last night. So um, we're trying to make this happen. Uh, treatment and drug updates. Um, so um, I'm going to go through each one of these. And, and I just want to make clear, I'm, I'm talking about the science here. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not... In, I'm not endorsing any particular political party when I discuss the science. <laughs> the science is what it is. Um, so hydroxychloroquine, azithromycin, you know, the ID society has come out strongly um, that based upon available evidence, um, suggesting that hospitals, providers just completely stop using hydroxychloroquine with or without the antibiotic azithromycin. So, you know, that ship has sailed. Um, there's very limited optimism um, that this is really going to be a quote unquote game changer or make a significant difference. And they actually, they came out with the updated statement, um, the 21st. So right the day we had recorded the last TWIF, um, remdesivir, um, you know, the, there is data to suggest benefit of five days of therapy, um, but only in select patients. So patients that require oxygen are not on a ventilator and are early in disease course. Um, again, it's, it's a therapy. It's not a game changer. Um, we still, with steroids, just to bring people up to speed, we have the um, the recovery trial that supported um, the role of dexamethasone, again, in a select number of patients, those that require oxygen, including those that require mechanical ventilation. Um, but I do want to put this into context, right? The, um, the mortality reduction was from 24.6% um, if they got no steroids to 21.6% if they got steroids. So, you know, yeah, that's that's a total that's a 3%. I know like 3 of 24.6 sounds a little more impressive, but 
um, yeah, it's, you know, again, this doesn't, this doesn't mean you can take off your masks and um, run about freely. Um, this is just a little bit of progress. Um, convalescent plasma. I think we were all shocked. Um, I was actually doing a lecture for, um, you know, UC San Francisco this week. And the person right before me was talking about convalescent plasma. And, um, you know, you, you submit your slides, usually at least a day or two before. So suddenly he had to update his slides <laughs> because I don't think a lot of us saw this coming, you know, and we heard expert opinions saying, you know, we don't really have the data yet to know what to do with convalescent plasma. But boom, on Sunday, the FDA gave approval for expanded use of convalescent plasma. Um, and I had sort of, uh, I think, been a bit um, disparaged by the large Mayo Access Program because I really want the science to help guide us. This is not an innocuous therapy. There are certain harms. Um, we saw in the Mayo experience that there were a number of deaths that occurred within four hours of the transfusion that were actually judged as potentially due to convalescent plasma. Um, there were a number of cases where there was circulatory overload. So there's this um, transfusion-associated circulatory overload, or TACO. There's a transfusion-associated acute lung injury, or trolley. Uh, there were several cases of severe allergic transfusion reactions. And um, yeah, I mean, there's access here now, but we, we really need the science to guide us. Um, we suspect that earlier treatment with higher, tighter, neutralizing antibody-laden um, convalescent plasma is better. But again, we, we hope that that's true, but we don't have the science. So a um, little bit discouraging that this may prevent us from getting that science. Um, but you know, as the person who gave the lecture was saying, um, convalescent plasma is really a stopgap. This is not how we're gonna treat you know, COVID-19 patients um, going into the future. Um, the tocilizumab, the Actemra, the IL-6 receptor inhibitor, um, you know, really needs some randomized control data to tell us whether or not uh, this is something that is helpful in the context of steroids, but we still need those trials. Anticoagulation. Um, you know, currently anticoagulation with low molecular weight heparin is recommended um, by most um, guidance in all hospitalized patients um, with COVID-19. And then even for 45 to 90 days after discharge, here you're going to be switching to an oral agent usually. Um, but the data on this is really coming from a few retrospective studies. It's being extrapolated from other diseases. It's being sort of based upon calculations, what, we, what we're seeing as far as rates um, if we don't anticoagulate and balancing that against the risks should we anticoagulate. Um, there was a paper that came out about a week ago in the Journal of American College of Cardiology, um, and it was anticoagulation, mortality, bleeding, and pathology among patients hospitalized with COVID-19, a single health system study. That single health system was Mount Sinai. So thank you, Mount Sinai, for continuing, continuing to add to the literature. Um, this was an observational analysis, and we, we really need those randomized control trials. Um, but this, as I talked about, might be a little bit tough because this has really been quickly embraced and people are sort of saying like ethically, um, where do we go with this? So, you know, some of the studies may be low dose versus full dose anticoagulation. But um, in that study, they, show, they saw, um, you know, with thousands of patients, lower mortality, lower risk of intubation with anticoagulation. So, um, and understanding the course of COVID-19, um, I want to keep this short, right? Because these, these are the bullet points. We've got busy clinicians who need to, I don't know what you need to do, but you should keep listening to TWIV. Um, there was an article out of France published in the Journal of Infection. It was post-discharge persistent symptoms and health-related quality of life after hospitalization for COVID-19. And it was actually describing post-hospitalization experience for a series of almost 300 patients. Um, you know, not all these patients, you know, made it. So they started off and some of them died, et cetera. Um, but they found that most patients that required hospitalization for COVID-19 still had persistent symptoms even 110 days after being discharged. Uh, most prominent was fatigue, trouble breathing. Um, so the, there, there's been a few articles starting to look at this. And, um, you know, uh, I think originally people turned themselves long haulers, but I'm starting to basically just say, you know what, COVID-19 has a tail. This is not, this is not an exception. It's not a rarity. The more experience we have with COVID-19, we're realizing um, a lot of people for weeks, for months, um, it, it takes a long time to recover. 
Um, and one of the challenges for a lot of these people um, is particularly in the New York area, when we had our surge back in March and April, a lot of individuals couldn't go for that test. Um, and there recently was um, some um, rulings as far as um, you know, people getting benefits and, and other things, and many HR departments um, basically are saying, we need that objective evidence. Where's that PCR from that initial infection? Um, so um, as has been discussed on TWIV, there are better serology tests um, that have been developed. So a negative, you know, serology back when it was the, uh, the first test out, maybe you're not as reliable. And we do think, right, that if you have a good serology test, most of these people, you're going to be able to pick up the antibodies. People make antibodies when you see something foreign. So, um, you know, trying to try to get objective evidence to help these people, help identify who these people are. Um, and another reason why everyone needs testing, because not only does it help us with acute management, but it helps folks down the road. So thank you, everyone, for listening to the, the COVID clinical update. I want to, again, um, thank all the people who have been supporting Floating Doctors. And I think we're actually going to get there. I think we're going to get to our goal of being able to help them with a $40,000 contribution. But everyone who goes to parasiteswithoutborders.com forward slash donate and donates during um, this month and September, um, we are going to double what you give us up to a um, contribution to floating doctors of forty thousand dollars. So help us, help us, help them. All right. How about two email questions to wrap it up? Uh, the first one is from Kip, who wants to know what Daniel meant when you said we are headed for the darkest winter in American history. Um. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I like to think of the Christmas Carol, you know, the the Dixon, the um, Charles Dickens story where, you know, the ghost of Christmas future comes and basically says, this is what is going to happen if you don't change um, how you act Ebenezer Scrooge. And, um, you know, I was talking to my dad on the phone today and it was an interesting um, discussion about, you know, what's ahead of us. And I said, you know, what, we, we really need to. And so talking about the New York area, we really need to do everything we can here. Because, you know, the last time we had this disaster in New York and the rates went up, the rest of the country came to our aid, doctors, nurses, equipment. But you know what? If we don't do it right and if we, if we can't get accurate testing, if we can't get that out there, if we don't open our schools properly, um, next time when we start seeing a rise in cases, those people aren't going to be able to come and help us because they're going to be having their own troubles all across the country. So um, this is actually, I think Redfield was saying the same thing, like this will be a disaster if people don't really do what's being recommended and keep these rates down. All right. Then we have one from Bill Binder, who is a professor of emergency medicine at uh, the medical school at Brown University and also co-editor in chief of the Rhode Island Medical Journal. Uh, Bill says, first, a comment. Uh, one of his favorite lines from a podcast is from you, Daniel. A physician is a technician with some science background. <laughs> Painfully true, excluding, of course, Dr. Griffin. Uh, second, a quote, it's not enough that we do our best. Sometimes we have to do what's required, and that's Churchill. <laughs> Third, a series of questions. How do we know that one to three million copies of RNA can result in transmission? Uh, where's the link for that? And I think you just mentioned a, a study out of China, right? Yeah, actually, let me just, um, you know, I'll, I'm going to actually probably try to put this out as a publication or a letter, but there were a few studies. So one was predicting infectious SARS-CoV-2 from diagnostic samples. That was in CID, clinical infectious disease. Another was the relative transmissibility of asymptomatic COVID-19 infections among close contacts. Um, another was the culture-based virus isolation to evaluate potential infectivity of clinical specimens tested for COVID-19. And then there are a few others. Um, but yeah, I'm going to actually, um, working with the UH G group to put out, um, you know, I said, maybe we'll even just get it out as a preprint so people have access to it. Um, so they can see what, what's the science, right? Because I, I create these tables, but the tables and the different levels, they're, they're based upon the science. So Okay. And he also wants to know, what's the evidence for fomite transmission? You know, it's contact tracing and it's pretty low. It's, we think that's a minor route. We think this is, it, it's a respiratory, it's a droplet transmission. So this is someone talking, singing, sneezing, coughing in your face. Got it. 
All right. That is our weekly COVID-19 update with Dr. Daniel Griffin. Thank you very much, Daniel. Oh, thank you. Pleasure as always. Joining me today from Fort Lee, New Jersey, Dixon de Pommier. Hello, Vincent and everybody else. The weather outside is not so bad. Uh, it's in the low 80s. Uh, humidity is about uh, 45%, I would guess. And um, next week promises to be a week that I can actually go fishing because the water temperature will be below 70 degrees all day long. Also joining us from Austin, Texas, Rich Condit. Hello, everybody. It is 99 degrees headed, yes. for, a, headed for 103. Yeah. You didn't okay. get this hurricane thing? What is it, Laura? Uh, no. no, it didn't touch us. Didn't touch boy, us. Boy, Luis Banner got trashed. Yeah, I mean, it's on, it's headed for you, right? S suppose. I think tomorrow it's going to rain. That's it. Yeah, I don't think we're going to have any winds. You could use the rain. Boy, what a mess Louisiana was. Yeah. yeah. It's terrible. Also joining us from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. And uh, my wife was was amused to see that she was the headline uh, all through the news. So she, Laura is her name. Laura. <laughs> yeah, once in a while you get the headline, right? Yeah. I, I um, Hurricane Allen misspelled um, was retired <laughs> a number of years ago. So they're never going to use that name again because Allen was just too destructive. And I, maybe they'll do the same thing with Laura. Has there ever been a Hurricane Vincent? Must have been, I guess. Maybe. It's probably extremely destructive. They claim that that was the worst wind landfall of a, or a hurricane in the history of the United States. Yeah, Laura. 155 oh, wow. miles an hour. Yeah. Hey, she set a record. That's All right. Bad. Hurricane Hurricane Vince. Vince, no, no, no. Was an unusual hurricane in the Northeast Atlantic Basin. <laughs> unusual. Unusual. Vince, I, don't, I don't go by Vince, so that's not me. Yeah, no. it, it's it, it developed in waters that were thought to be too cold for um, hurricanes. Just so you know, listeners, hurt. you know, we have a lot of new people here. Uh, I I go by Vincent. If you want, Vinny is okay. Did you, you see my cousin Vinny? That was a good movie. All but the time. I don't like Vince for some reason. I don't like huh. it. There's no uh, Hurricane Vinny. So. <laughs> no. However, there is a my cousin Vizzy, Vinny. All right. And just to be clear for anybody who is affected by Hurricane Laura or was previously affected by Vince or uh, <laughs> or Alan, um, <laughs> sorry, sorry to hear about that and hope you all get uh, get stuff straightened out soon. Yeah, it's not exactly. fun to lose your house. I think that's horrible. No, I'm very no sorry. that would be that would be awful. If, uh, say, if, I were, matter of if I were a billionaire and I'm not by not even close, if I were a billionaire, I'd buy you all new houses. That's how nice I would be. But Speaking of losing houses, I have uh, friends in uh, Santa Cruz whose oh, houses yeah. are inside the fire line. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, so I have not heard from them, yeah, but it can't be that good. That does suck. That no. does suck. That's right. If you like what we do here on Twitter, you could consider supporting us financially because we have very little support for this, except yours, microbe.tv slash contribute. I also want to remind you, if you want to chat with a virologist, I don't know why you would want to do that, frankly, but <laughs> just kidding. Uh, it's a good thing to chat with a virologist. Uh, you can go to ASV.org, and uh, you scroll down, and there's a part of the website that says chat with a virologist, and you can go there and see they have curated 300 virologists, and you could contact one and have them talk to your high school or your do they curate the virologist with formaldehyde or? Yeah, that's right. Wow. Formaldehyde. <laughs> ASV.org. All right. So, so we have some things to talk about initially here. There's always something to talk about. Sing There's always something. Now, always. You know, this is, the first story is in the saying of Alan a couple of weeks ago. What is it you said? I'm afraid now. I have no idea. We have to, we can no longer trust the CDC. <laughs> Yes. You said something like that, right? Yes, it's it's it is a sad state of affairs in which we have to tell people that they shouldn't follow the advice of the CDC. And it's, here we go again. So earlier this week the CDC announced quietly, of course, they're modifying Very testing guidelines to exclude people who do not have symptoms even if they've been recently exposed. Now, here on Twiv where we talk from the point of view of science, science-based evidence, this makes zero sense to us. And so either someone is much smarter than we are, or 
it's being done for some other purpose. Now, to be clear, there there are a lot of people who are smarter than I am, at least. But um, this is very clearly being done for a different they, purpose. Yeah. Yes. Many, many experts questioned this move. They called it dangerous yeah. um, and um, bizarre. Many states no, have refused not, uh, to I'm, follow the I'm rules. Sorry, I'm sorry to say that it is not bizarre. It is a <laughs> consistent part of a pattern. And the sole purpose of implementing a change like this is to lower the case count numbers before the election. Yes. That's yeah, the only that? reason to do this. Yes. Yeah, so that was, of course, the uh, this. Well, what's happening, Dixon? I'm trying to uh -oh. find that statement that I can just hold up in the front of the screen. No, it's uh, very puzzling on many oh, levels. Has always been <laughs> <laughs> it's it's easier than saying it every yes. time. <laughs> then uh, after this story broke, um, there were stories uh, indicating or suggesting that top U.S. officials told CDC to soften these testing guidelines. All right, so this came from above, and then there was a lot of back and forth saying, oh, it was approved by all the docs, even before the president saw it, even Tony Fauci. And of course, he was under surgery at the time this was signed. So how he could have signed off on it is, is uh, they say here, there's no weight on the scales by the president or the vice president or Secretary Azar. And I think this is a downright lie, but what do I know? I know people are going to get mad at me for saying this. But um Governor Cuomo said the only plausible rationale is that they want fewer people taking tests because, as the president has said, if you don't take tests, you won't know the number of people who are who are positive. Right. And this comes shortly after, and I think we talked about this last week, the administration had the FDA approve, give emergency uh, authorization uh, to um, convalescent serum, which we had just talked about not being useful. <laughs> according to the trials right. so far. Right. So uh, we had a bunch of people um, mail, in, mail in about this, and one was Justin who wrote, CDC was pressured. There's a CNN article he sent from the top down to change coronavirus testing guidance. The, he said, Justin wrote, this blows my effing mind. Maybe we shouldn't have political appointments in important science-based agencies, which probably not a bad idea, right? There at least I, ought to be. I hope. I kind of hope that what comes out of this is not just with respect to scientific or uh, health-related agencies, but other agencies that are supposed to be immune from political influence uh, in, in the government. That I think there are, you know, there are guidelines to try and uh, keep them <clears throat> uh, uh, free of. Uh, political influence, but there has to be, I think, obviously, there has to be some sort of enforcement legislated uh, that can maintain good behavior and the guidelines. Uh, and not that that's necessarily going to work, but the, the, you know, there has to be some something more than what the exists. The usual could. mechanism for maintaining sanity in these types of appointments is to have the traditional balance of power where the legislative branch oversees the executive branch and the judicial branch provides a backstop. But when you have one um, political organization that is in charge of all three branches of government, um, all deciding that they're going to march in lockstep between behind the person who holds the White House, um, then you do not have a balance of powers functionally anymore. And that's where we are right now. But well, the biggest disadvantage without naming of, names, I'm trying. No, not no, you're to, not. You're, you're mean, being very neutral. But you all know what I'm talking about. <laughs> now, the biggest reason for not uh, going by this particular um, suggestion, which would be great, is that science often conflicts with economy. So the economy mm -hmm. says, if or you, with ideology, or without. Well, that's true too. But let's just take air of, pollution. That's kind of saying the same thing. Yeah, if but, you took air pollution as an example and you said, but it's because you're burning fossil fuels, so let's burn less fossil fuels. Are you kidding me? That answer I mean, doesn't sell well. Yeah. It, well, it has never sold well, and it probably won't until we have to. But well, that's the reason why these people are put in there to begin with. So, Dixon, it's, it's quite clear that, you know, science uh, tells society what things to do, but you also have to balance society supports science, but 
science has to take into account the needs of society, right? So it has to of, be a back and forth. However, Absolutely. in this case, we are not taking into account society's needs. We are taking into account a, a political party's needs, and that's not what's supposed to happen. You're supposed right. to make people well by testing them, not by not. And the purpose, well, the purpose of science and a policy decision. So there, you can think of it in three levels of of decision making. Um, for public policy, there's fact, there's value, and there's policy. So fact is, this is an apple, this is an orange, right? Is it an apple or is it an orange? You can determine that as a factual matter, and that is a scientific question. And it is the job of science to settle factual matters the best we can. And we don't always get, we don't always know 100% what the answer is. We may say, okay, we're 90% sure that this is an apple, but we, we can't really see the whole thing because it's just mm -hmm. some pieces of it. Um, so we give the answer that we have and limitations that we have, and that settles the issue, the issue of fact. Value is, should we eat the apple or the orange or neither? Well, Oof. okay, <laughs> you can argue about the value of one nutritionally or the other and, and go on about that, and that's the intermediate level of it. And then policy is, what are we actually going to do? So that's for the deliberative bodies, the legislative bodies to settle. And the purpose of science into that, into that process is to underlie it all and say, okay, well, here are the facts. And then as private citizens, we can say, all right, well, yeah, I'm a scientist. I know what the facts are, but my values and my policy suggestion would be this. Um, and right now what we have is just uh, policy decisions being made based on the whims of one person. Um, yep. Well, I don't not. think they're whims. I disagree with you, Alan. I think they're purposeful. Yeah, I they think are. They're loading up the pockets of rich people. Well, parts, parts of and that's yes, not parts of, whimsical. Yeah. That is pointed. So, right. So parts of the organization actually do have um, agendas to loot the process. Yeah. Um, but then there's also just this this set of urges that drive some some random activities. You see, well. people in the south. There are five people that are, I think. Got into there are the five emergency people in rooms the South? from from drinking Clorox. Yes. So you know um, that if, shows you how much they actually believe. Would you drink Clorox? I mean, I don't care who told me. No, I wouldn't. If you did, Dixon. And they're still taking hydroxychloroquine. I don't get this. So, I don't uh, get any of this. Later in the week, the White House announced it spent seven hundred fifty million dollars on rapid test kits, which we'll get to in a minute. Which is funny because they just told CDC to test less and now they're buying this. No, well, you know what so, they're doing? They're going to burn them. I'm sorry, what did you say? <laughs> burn the test kits. Yes, they're going to buy them and then burn them. Ooh, oh, now a, we have a shortage. Oh, I'm so sorry. All right, so uh, we'll talk about the Abbott kit in a moment. Right. Now, I wanted to just mention more news out of Moderna this week. You know, Tell me if you think this is the right headline. Moderna says COVID-19 vaccine shows signs of working in older adults. No. How old? <laughs> when I when I saw that headline, I immediately thought, gee, it's too soon, I think, the Wall for Church. them to know whether or not uh, people are uh, protected from Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, and now that, is, that was that was the Wall Street Journal headline. The CNBC right. headline, I think, is more realistic. That says Moderna says its coronavirus vaccine shows promising results in small trial of elderly patients. Right. That's that's more accurate. They are they are promising results, and this was all this coverage, by the way, came from um, a presentation that Moderna gave at the ASIP meeting on August 26th. The ASIP is an advisory committee on immunization practices. And that's the CDC and other agencies and representatives of a whole bunch of groups get together. And this is the group that comes up with recommendations like who should get a flu shot, who should get a measles vaccine, et cetera. Is um, that presentation available? Yes, it is. Yeah, and linked I linked right it here, here um, in the show notes in the, in the show notes, and we can put that link so all that, I mean, as we've talked about before, Moderna is bound by by securities regulations w when they're going to have data like this that aren't just within the company. They have to let everybody know. This is uh, a, so they, they this release is their nice. slides online. This is very nice. This is a continuation of the phase one trial, right, which is yep. still ongoing. And it's just in this case extended to uh, older people. Well, it's, right? So what this is, yeah. So they've so what they've done is they've taken um, 
data from, they've got a good graph in here of their ongoing clinical trial process, um, which if you look at it, you'll say, oh my God, December of 2021 to finish the phase three. But they're, um, they're, they've got the timeline set, giving themselves plenty of padding. Um, so if you look at when things started, Mm. This is this is from their early trials where they were doing the dose ranging studies. And I think uh, is this also from the phase two safety and immunogenicity is from it's from the trials that they've already got ongoing, obviously, um, not the one that they just started enrolling for the phase three in, in July. So they're stockpiling um, vaccine now, though, right? Well, right. They're starting. They they've got the money to build up manufacturing, even as they're doing the phase three, which is right. that's right. that whole thing Tony Fauci talked about on the show, where they're doing it at risk, meaning at monetary risk, um, to somebody else, uh, namely someone uh, else's monetary taxpayers. risk. Yes. That's right. That's right. Um, <laughs> so uh, not, and I and I think that's a fine use of my taxpayer money, better than a lot of the other uses right for here. it. So they're doing this, um, they've got this study ongoing. They've included people from different age groups, which is, of course, important because of the age distribution of, of morbidity in this disease. And the money shots in this presentation, freely downloadable off the Moderna website, um, are, I guess, slides 9, 10, and 11, where they're showing the range of neutralizing antibody levels in different age groups. So you've got the 18 to 55, 56 to 70, and 71 plus groups. And that 71 plus groups, these are all kind of smallish numbers of patients, and you're not basing a whole lot on this, but it's very, it's very nice to see that out to 57 days that they've tracked this, all the patients are getting good neutralizing antibody responses. They looked at T-cell responses, and it looks like the older patients are responding about as well as the, the younger patients mm -hmm. to the vaccine. Yeah. So it's great. This is a nice presentation. This is it is. Yeah. It is. So and they, I think uh, the, the live presentation itself may also be archived online. You can check um, the Moderna site for that. But if just looking at the slides gives you the data. 10 adults between 56 and 70 and 10 adults 71 and older, 100 microgram doses, two doses, 28 days apart. And, you know, in the original uh, phase one, they had not done older people. And, you know, it, right. so that's unusual. Usually you would have that. And but in this case, they went forward to a phase two, three with just the younger phase one. But now we have it. So, well, I think, said, yeah, I think good. usually what you do is you do the phase one on the you know, the six healthy 20 year olds yeah. who you want for toxicity right. testing anyway. And then if that goes well, you'd go to the older age groups and Phase do that one. trial. And then you do the, yes. you know, move on to, uh, but since everything's accelerated here, they just put it into the whole set of age groups in the phase one. Right. So it makes one of my age group feel young at heart. Yes, <laughs> yes of course. Now, of course, this tells us, as Rich said, you know, some of the headlines made us think about efficacy, but we're not there yet. And, right. uh, that's a ways off, and hopefully a good they, ways off. Hopefully they, we will. They do compare. They do compare this. Uh, hold on, hold on, breaking up again. Okay, resume. Up is hard. To okay, do. so they do compare this with um, convalescent sera, and when you look at the graphs, you'll see the the range of convalescent sera from actual SARS CoV two patients. So that that's oh, your right. real world right. comparison right. level. Right. Right. Assuming yeah. that's protective, right. then. Yeah. All right. Well, it's good. It's, it's so so far. So far, it's good. I have not seen any bad news. No, with these vaccines, not yet. Not yeah, it was too early. I mean, the bad news would have been if they well, had bad not side too early effects. For bad. Right? We, yeah, we could have we could have had bad news already. <laughs> no, it's not too early, but it's too early for efficacy and durability. Yes. And oh yeah, stuff. Yes. but we're gonna hope yeah, that it's very what nice you, to see that this is well tolerated and that it's doing what we would hope that it would do at this phase. What do you predict the cost of the vaccine will be? It'll be free for whatever the hell they want to charge. It should be free no, for I'm, everyone. <laughs> yeah, the, yeah, the U.S. is paying for this early production, right? Uh, this is from true. from uh, what do you call that program? Warp speed and right, uh, et cetera. Uh, Active, so the, active is the other the, thing. Active. But the I think a lot a lot of the money is in BARDA. Yes, that's that's sort of the deep pockets for this kind of thing. This is a time when because vaccines shouldn't difference. cost anything, testing shouldn't cost anything because they're spending right. way more on economic recovery than on this stuff, and that's here, ridiculous. Here. Okay, here, here. but they're still going to charge. You'll see they're already charging for testing, and Daniel says all the time they shouldn't be, and 
right. It's just not right. But that is this administration. It's just not right. That's not about you, folks. Well, and it's not even a um, it's not even it should be free because for moral reasons, you should test even people who can't afford it. But just for epidemiological reasons, the people who are least able to afford the test are the people you may most need to be testing. And so yeah. See, that's you what need I'm concerned to about. not yeah. have that barrier there. Yeah. Just I don't want a barrier. That's right. Doug. We can afford it, but I want people who cannot afford it to get it. Because yes. they need to be tested and vaccinated. It's very important. This is an unusual situation for sure. So I wonder a little bit about, because there, uh, uh, what was, oh, the CARES Act, right? Yep. There was money in that for testing. And I know that my daughter went to a local uh, doc in the box to get tested. And that was a test. She was sampled. They sent it off to Houston. And it came back with a result within 24 hours. And it didn't cost her anything. Okay. So uh, I think that if the, uh, if things are set up right, there is money to cover the, the there was like no questions asked. This wasn't, yeah. uh, do you have insurance or anything like that? This is just, yeah, we'll test. Has, any, yeah. has anybody calculated how much money has been lost just by the illness itself? Oh, I'm sure people have calculated. Uh, yeah. So I'm why sure don't they compare goes. that then to the cost of immunizing and getting people back to work and in school? Because I don't that's get not that current, at all. That is not currently how we make decisions in this I country. I do not at the get level. that at all. Get used okay. to it, Dixon. This is the new normal. Yeah. No, well, maybe I'm it'll change. Enough, not maybe to have to change. get me used to it. I'm going to die before this thing becomes. Uh, you know, maybe I'll uh, forget. No, it. no, stick around, uh, Dixon. Stick, stick around. around. We want to see how this ends. I'm not going here, yeah, right? <laughs> All right. We have another interesting story. This is uh, um, just uh, published, Clinical Infectious Diseases, COVID-19 Reinfection. Uh, I can't even get past that. Okay? COVID-19 Reinfection. What the hell is COVID-19 Reinfection? SARS-CoV-2 Reinfection. But that's the way they do it, and it's just so that it pisses me off, Right? <laughs> SARS-CoV-2. Do you think they do that actually deliberately to piss you off? No, they don't, obviously. Okay. Nobody knows about me, but there is a Vincent on this paper, you know, <laughs> Vincent Chi Chung Cheng. Uh, SARS-CoV-2 reinfection, and I am refixing the title, by a phylogenetically distinct sars coronavirus 2 strain confirmed by whole genome sequencing. A host of authors out of um, University of Hong Kong, State Laboratory for Infectious Diseases, um, Hong Kong, Hong Kong, Hong Kong, Hong Kong. Okay, so this is this is a case in Hong Kong. Hong Kong. Mostly Hong Kong. And did they get sick or did they just get infected? Could you just wait and let let's go through it? <laughs> no spoilers, get, Dixon. Dixon, I understand you're very <laughs> excited to hear. Now you want me to die. <laughs> no, no, no. Okay, so this is Pick what up your goddamn mind. This is the first report that I think has credence. All the others have been anecdotal, no mm -hmm. no supported by data. So patient was a healthy Hong Kong male. He was he got sick back in March, fever, cough, headache, sore throat, got a PCR test was SARS-CoV-2 positive, and then he was hospitalized for two weeks, although they don't say he was short, short of breath, but maybe it was early enough it, on. Yeah, it doesn't sound like he was very sick. No. It sounded like he had a fairly moderate case. I think uh, given the response in, in Hong Kong, which handled this very well, I yeah, think he was true. probably hospitalized to isolate him. Isolate him. him. Yeah, yeah, that's a good yeah. point. Very good point. Um, so they so, were on top of so this. So apparently during those two weeks, he got better. And then at the, towards the end of his stay, they did two PCRs, 24 hours apart. They were both negative, so they discharged him. Okay, so he's recovered. Then apparently he went to Spain. And uh, on the 15th of August, he, he came back to Hong Kong from Spain. And I guess part of the coming back, you're tested, PCR tested. He was not symptomatic. He was PCR tested. He was positive. So put him back in the hospital. <laughs> even though he was asymptomatic this time, I guess, as you said, to uh, isolate him. And during the stay, uh, his viral load, oropharyngeal viral loads gradually decreased, so his infection is resolving. And now here's the interesting part, the serology. Um, the first infection, he was IgG negative for the SARS-CoV-2 nucleoprotein 10 days after symptom onset, okay? And one day after hospitalization for the second episode. So uh, then 
after the second episode, they took a specimen five days after hospitalization, and that was IgG positive. So the way I interpret that is the first infection, 10 days after symptom onset, too soon for IgG. Yeah. They They should have looked for IgM. But then after the second infection, he gets IgG within five days, which is a memory response. So that makes sense. So I think it was clear he was infected twice from that. Um, and then, of course, they had the two the two viruses, and they did whole genome sequencing, and Eric, he was clearly infected by two different isolates, one that was circulating in Hong Kong and one uh, circulating in Europe. Very clear, very clear differences. So he was infected twice. All right, so I I believe this. I think the data look good. Everyone think. Yes. Yeah. Real, One real thing that interests so, me. So people can get infected, can get reinfected with this virus. It's the end of the world. Right? Uh, thank you. Yes, this is what people were saying. Yes, but we'll say we'll tell you why it's not the case. Yes, no. Rich. What were you? Uh, just a little uh, side note that I don't understand is that the uh, serum test they did was for nucleocapsid, not yeah. spike. Yes. Okay. Now. I mean, that may be a triviality, but if you want to look for something that might correlate with neutralization. Hey, it's your kid. <laughs> That's Harper. Is that, is that Harper? Hey, Harper. Hey, bye. There she My is. Gosh. Hey, and Porter. Oh, and there's Porter. Porter. This. Porter, Harper. <laughs> That's all right. I'm going to get Ivan in here in a minute. You'll see. Wait, they were, wait, they uh, were, wait, a, wait a second. Last time I saw them, they were half that height. Uh, That's right. Wow. Hey, wait. They didn't yeah. just bring you beer, did they? No, it's a LaCroix. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, I'm kidding. Yeah. I'm yeah. kidding. So I texted him and told him I was, hey, you who, know. Can somebody afterwards. bring me? Uh, yeah, there you go. Yeah, we are on. This is uh, Nana. There, there's a cat asleep in the chair over here, but I don't think he's bringing me anything. This is Nana and Dude Camp. Very nice. Parents parents are off at work. We're doing we're doing our job. Oh, this Dixon went fun. off to get his grandkids. Oh, uh, boy. There this, you go. I, I don't have any grandkids. <laughs> uh, at any rate, so. Uh, nuclear uh, capsid, yeah. Want, yeah, if you wanted to assay for an antigen that might uh, represent potential virus neutralization, you'd do spike. But I don't know yeah. why they did that and they didn't do spike. But nucleocapsid is perfectly fine. Okay, it's, it's an a, it's, a, it's, it's a, an immune response. So yeah. You get an abundant response against it. Yes, and in fact, can be neutralizing as well. So this is perfectly fine. So I'm convinced that this is a reinfection. Now, of course, the press uh, and many scientists said this is really bad news, but. I don't think it's bad news at all because he didn't get sick. I think it's sick. great news. I think he this is wonderful sick. news. Yeah, he didn't I get this sick. Is, exactly. It's a great example of how immunity, protective immunity works. And yeah, you know, the ultimate fantasy of immunity would be sterilizing immunity that you get infected and you can never, ever be infected with that virus again. It can't replicate. It can't get a toehold. You can't be a carrier. That That was wonderful. Um, but that's... That's probably not you know, going to happen. We, we <laughs> almost, so, so protective immunity, you know, you get infected again, you don't get sick. The guy got put in the hospital because that's what they do there. Um, and he's fine. So oh, look, we have another, oh, there grand, we go. another yeah. grandchild. Wow. Who do we Where'd have here? Where did that red hair come from? Say hello. <laughs> that's not <laughs> how you say hello. Well, this is enough. Vincent and this is Richard. And that's Alan. Hi. <laughs> and this that's is our podcast. And this is Ivan. Hi, Schultz. Ivan. Ivan wow. Schultz. Ivan. Good to meet you, Adam. Cool. Okay, man. Ivan. Say goodbye. <laughs> nah. That's good enough. You said he, he was so the, Dixon. You said he was so eloquent. I didn't. I just heard squeaks. And he could do the quadratic equation in his sleep, but he doesn't choose to show that's off. That's fine. Right now. That's fine. And and the thing is that um, <laughs> so this right. person was protected yet. You know, the anyway, the nucleocapsid antibody had waned quite low by that first day of the second infection. So I think it's telling us there's some other kind of immunity that protected the most likely cellular immunity, right? Yes. So I think it's fine. And it's just like a common cold coronavirus, right? You get infected, immunity wanes, you get reinfected, but you don't get sick. And some people said this means this is bad news for vaccines. No, it's not. The best news for vaccines. <laughs> it's That's fine. It. I mean, now, a vaccine, as Alan said, it's probably not going to protect you from getting infected. And you will probably transmit. This person probably was transmissible the second time, but you're not going to get sick. So it doesn't matter. If, you know, the common cold coronas transmit everywhere and people don't get sick. So if that's where this one ends up, I think we're okay. 
with yeah, that, so right? All the way back to 12, 585, the first visit from uh, mm-hmm. Ralph Barrick, who said this may, I mean, this doesn't prove it. This is one case. But the idea was this may turn out to be uh, similar to yeah. one of the uh, endogenous yeah. human uh, coronavirus. I like so maybe someday like there will be herd immunity then. Yeah. Well, well we through need, a vaccine is the way we'd like to get it. We yeah. need a new definition or some new vocabulary around the concept of herd immunity. Yeah. Okay? Because there may be... Uh, there may be uh, high levels of seropositivity. There may be, under those conditions, uh, immunity relative to disease, but that doesn't mean that there's immunity to infection. Yeah. Right. Okay. Because yeah. you can mm-hmm. still get infected, and that will support the an ongoing keeps boosting. pool of virus. Right. And okay? what that, what that does okay. mean? Right. What that does mean for vaccines, though, is um, if this turns out to be the case, and if we get to a vaccine that induces similar protective immunity, which I think is what most of us are were kind of expecting anyway, um, then getting 70% of the population vaccinated is not going to save the 30% who didn't get the vaccine. Or anti-vaxxers. Um, yeah, I mean, if you're so, right. if you're not getting that immunity, then you do not have the protection if the virus is still capable of circulating through those who do have the protective immunity. In this case, I think polio is a good model. How so, Dixon? Well, because there's a smaller group of people that have never been vaccinated, and there's a very large group that has, and every now and then this thing surfaces in various odd places, like rural Minnesota, for instance, or Pakistan, or someplace in Nigeria. Um and that's probably what's going to happen here, too, then. It's a little different with polio because what we're seeing surfacing now is actually often vaccine-derived. Yeah. Oh, you know, no, I'm, I'm sure the mechanism and, and is that, different. Yeah. The, the, the uh, immunity, sporadicness of it. Immunization drops in certain areas and they yeah, have yeah, outbreaks, yeah. That's, right? That's what I and with, that's and with um, the live polio vaccine, uh, sorry, Vincent, the... With the oral polio vaccine, <laughs> yeah, one um, of our that's the a- active vaccine, uh, it is possible to get a, a almost a sterilizing immunity. Like those people won't act as carriers for yeah the OPV, a period of but time. not IPV. So that's a good IPV. point. Right. Uh, IPV uh, will let the virus enter your gut and reproduce yes. and transmit. Actually, so it's not right. a sterilizing. Many of the vaccines that are very effective are not blocking not infection. sterilizing immunity. Yeah, yeah. and I, someone wrote an op-ed in the Times this week, which really got me upset. It said, this vaccine to work <laughs> has to prevent infection and disease. And I'm like, no, 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 it doesn't have to prevent infection, only disease. And that's the right. problem with SARS-CoV-2 that everyone's seeing it for the first time. So people are getting sick, especially if you're older. But once the population is immune, that's not going to be the pattern. And by the way, Rich, with you know redefining herd immunity, I think I've always interpreted to be what, it's how you define it, preventing infection or disease. It depends on the situation. Right. You have to be flexible, right? But, right. you know, if people aren't familiar with the term, they wouldn't know that. Right. right. And I and as we've seen before, a lot of people conflate infection with disease, right? They yes. think it's the same it's thing. I well, I mean, if yes. you have a research paper talking about COVID-19 reinfection, <laughs> uh, which, by the way, if, even if you took that at face value, the manuscript does not show COVID-19 reinfection because he didn't develop COVID-19 the second time around. There you go. It's even more wrong. Uh, Vincent, you really put your, your finger on it. Conflating infection and disease. Yes. Because that's, that's been a major problem all the way along with the evaluating whether the kids are a problem going back to school and et cetera. In well, microbiology in sense, 101. It's actually, it's actually good that the I, I find it annoying sometimes that the virus and the disease have separate names in this case. But it's good. Yeah. Um, but it ends up being maybe a good thing. The, mm-hmm. Because it does force people to acknowledge that distinction. Yeah. Okay, another story from the New York Times this week. This one is uh, nice for us. How Dr. Fauci found himself talking to Julia Roberts, Lil Wayne, and just about any podcaster who asked. Hey, just about any podcaster. That's you, Vincent. Uh, I don't know who Lil Wayne is. I know who Julia Roberts is. You could find out by going online. <laughs> Well, among the uh, among the just about any podcaster who asked in that category, 
uh, is not only us, but uh, also Matthew McConaughey. And I don't mind being in the same. Hold it, hold it. Anyway, this article uh, from the Times, um, you know, they talk about this week in virology, and and they have a picture, they have a screen capture of uh, me and Rich and Tony. Actually, they have a little video playing. Right, you can scroll oh, down. Yeah. Anyway, there's a bunch of different podcasters and celebrities, and we're one of them. But I think it's a very nice, one of them. it's a very nice article. But uh, just about any podcaster seems like a backhanded comment, doesn't it? So a I compliment? just noticed. Well, like I said, you know, if we're in the same pool as Matthew McConaughey, that's okay with me. <laughs> yeah, and by the way, I um, I do know that Lil Wayne is a famous rap star. He's a rap star. Okay. Yeah, he's he's a big deal. And I just noticed that they actually. Uh, they link to the the actual podcast and say uh, at some uh, how many views there have been. And at the time this was published, we had thirty six thousand YouTube. Yeah, McConaughey had one point two million. Yeah. What's he got that we don't have? I don't do, know. Do you really want an answer to that, Rich? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Tell, what's the answer? Is he funny? Uh, fame, fortune. I also, I, also uh, uh, I noticed he's wearing his glasses, right? There was somebody commented that, and Julia Roberts is wearing her glasses. Somebody commented on these things that when you talk to Tony Fauci and you want to look like intellectual, you put on your glasses. Put on, maybe I should start wearing mine. <laughs> you didn't even i know that <laughs> you know um i it's a very nice, nice article the, the one of the reporters called me the the day before to talk about it um and she mentioned us quite a bit she gave us just more than a yeah. passing mention so it's very nice i appreciate it's, it's it. it's a great plug yes and um she was interested in you know how hard it was to get dr fauci and i said well you know we've had him on Five years ago, and she said, "Well, how old is your podcast?" And I said, "It's twelve <laughs> years old." Yeah, right. She's so she was very impressed, and so we are virologists. We're his colleagues, and she said, "Yeah, I could tell that because he seemed very at ease with you." And I said, "But here's what I did the second time," and she didn't write any of this up, but she was very interested. I, I know his chief of staff, right? And I emailed him. I said, "How would I go about getting a, an appointment?" And the funny thing he said to me, here's what you have to do. You have to me email eight, these eight people and you have to request a, a time. And then we have a meeting every morning, a, a strategy meeting, and we'll discuss it. So I emailed all eight people. And he said to me, uh, you know, whether he does it will depend on his mood that day. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, after the, I emailed it and I said, you know, you may remember us, we interviewed you and Got a lot of listeners now. We'd like 30 minutes of your time. Any time will do. And uh, the next day they said, first uh, reaction is very positive. Stay tuned. And then in a few days they said, okay, we'll do it next Thursday at 2.30, whatever it was. But don't, it's not confirmed until the day before because his schedule could change. And that was it, really. But apparently they were they were trying to get him to reach out and do other media besides mass media, right? CNN and CBS and NBC and so right. forth. So Good he, idea. Was, he was doing podcasts and speaking with scientists and so forth. Yeah. So, uh, but I think if we ask him, he'll come back. No problem, right? Absolutely. Because he knows it's a scientific crowd and so forth. But anyway, it was fun. And yeah, th I think th th for the impression I got from watching that episode was um, it was it was a nice break for him. <laughs> yeah. Yep. No, he I, I think Rich. I think Rich commented it, it probably was nice for him to be asked questions that he didn't know the answers to. <laughs> yeah, no, he said well, that. Well, and and we steered away from politics. Yeah, oh, yeah, of course. Oh, we're interested in the science, but you know, he said often we don't have a lot of answers here. So yeah, been ten months or so, maybe data free zone. He used. Yes, data, is that what he said? Data, data free, free zone. zone. That was one of my favorite <laughs> phrases. Oh, no, don't let good. Um, don't let good stand on the way. Don't let perfect stand on the way of good. Yeah, I like right. that statement. Yeah. Did he say that during that episode? Yes, he, he did. did. And he had, it was it was absolutely quotable. It was That's a good. beautiful statement. That's good. So anyway, thank you to the Times and uh, many people have sent that in. We appreciate it and welcome if some of you have joined uh, as a consequence. However, I think it doesn't give us a big bump, and here's why. Yesterday, I spoke with Michael Minna, right? Um, trying to hook him up with a company that could make billions of paper strips, right? So I had an idea. So I set up this meeting and Michael said, after TWIV, 
the response was unbelievable. He said, senators, <laughs> representatives, mayors, governors, they all know because people are writing them. It's, and it didn't happen before. And I just wanted to tell listeners that Twiv made the big difference in getting this well known because yeah. he had written an op-ed in the Times two weeks before and nothing really happened as a consequence, right? But here we had him on and we're talking and we're our eyes are getting bigger as he's talking and we're learning and asking and people could see this, right? They could see, whoa, something's happening here, which you can't see in the printed word, right? So I think that and probably, you know, it's a social media and so forth. Well, yeah, yeah it's an audience that's engaged uh, and is uh, prone to taking action. And they wrote. Uh, which is great. They yeah. wrote, right? And they're still writing, as you will see. So I think it's great. This is the one big impact we have had. Sure. Because I think now, and Michael said this is going to happen now. It's going to take a little bit more time. But as uh, you see, uh, Abbott has a quick test, and uh, 3M came out with paper strips also, and many more companies um, are going to do it. So keep writing. If you're frustrated locally, keep writing because it made a difference. And Michael said it. After TWIV, it all changed. Isn't that cool? <laughs> well, That's <good>. awesome. <laughs> yep. Yep, Good. yep, yep, yep. Let's do some email. Ruth writes, hello, Twivers. A special hello to Kathy Spindler in Ann Arbor, where I spent two years getting my master's degree in psychiatric mental health nursing at the expense of the federal government in 1978. I listened to Twiv 657 and have once again had my mind blown by all that is known and all that is not yet known in the world of viruses, immunology, and vaccines. A couple of months ago, my 52-year-old son suggested I listen to Twiv. I am 77, and he must know me better than I know myself, because I am now listening to Twiv Immune Virology 101, and once I finish posting another thousand photos on my website from 18 years of RV world travel, I will be checking out more of these podcasts. <laughs> I have lots of questions for you, but this time I just want to make sure you have seen the New York Times article on Dr. Fauci's speaking gigs. Twiv gets more than just a mention in this article. I ponder why I and so many others love Twiv. I think one reason for me is that I became involved in what is similar to reading a detective novel and the non-staged commentary by you, dear scientists, leaves room for me to join in the mystery. Isn't that great? Very well said. <laughs> that's, that's great. <clears throat> you have made my being alive during this pandemic an exciting adventure, even though I suffered through a moderate case of COVID-19, and I'm getting really tired of staying put in my retirement community. Thank you all for showing the public what real scientists and real science is like. I am so grateful. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, she hit the nail on the head. You know, I was thinking about this last week or uh, Wednesday after, after we uh, recorded on Wednesday, and I was feeling at the end of that. You know, like I really so much enjoy getting together with you guys on a regular basis and doing this. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking that's probably what the listeners feel like, too, you know, yeah. is that they get to join with us yeah. in this conversation. Yeah, Great. It's a conversation. It's not a very formal interview, right, one-on-one. -on -one. It's a conversation where we're going back and forth and our, our lives pull into it as well. Yeah. Our Actually, the whole thing is scripted. We we, uh, we write the we, whole I, thing. The teleprompter is right up here. You'll <laughs> yeah. see it glance. It. Yeah. Except Dixon doesn't follow the script. Yeah, no, I don't know how to right. read anymore. What do you expect? <laughs> Rich, can you take the next one? Uh, James. Yeah. Uh, James writes as a retired physicist. I appreciate Twiv's scrutiny of opinion, expert or not. Keep up the good work. I keep listening. Recently, this article was posted on Yahoo News, and this is, uh, well, I will, he, he gives a link. He says, it summarizes the experiences of an ER physician who was exposed to the virus and developed symptoms. Her husband, an ER physician, was first in the family to exhibit symptoms. Per hospital protocol, mm -hmm. both were tested. His results were positive. Hers were negative. Over time, as she isolated with her 11-year-old son, she received negative tests four additional times, PCR and rapid antibody, even after developing symptoms. Eventually, her son became infected and tested positive. Several weeks after recovery, serum antibody tests were positive for all members of the family. The author attributes the negative uh, results to timing. When samples were taken relative to the course, when samples were taken relative to the course of infection, 
But timing isn't the only possible contributor to the discrepant results. My question for you is related to an issue I dealt with throughout my career, representative sampling. So let me get the situation straight here, okay? This is a family that ultimately everybody got sick, but one of them repeatedly tested negative. Yes. Okay? And the question is why? Uh, Okay, so publicly, and here's uh, the issue he deals with throughout his career, representative sampling. Publicly recommended personal protection measures seem to assume that the eyes and upper respiratory tract are by far the most likely locations of primary virus infection. The CDC guidelines for collection of test uh, samples also reflect this assumption. Quote, for initial diagnostic testing of SARS-CoV-2, CDC recommends collecting and testing an upper respiratory specimen, end quote. But isn't it possible for an infection to develop in another location, say lower respiratory tract, without migrating to the upper respiratory tract? Do you know if such localization of respiratory infections have been evaluated? It seems that too much attention is given to sensitivity, uh, signal to molecule, uh, uh, signal per molecule. Uh, equal attention should be given to where the molecules come from. Hmm. I don't know. I don't think it starts first in the tr- lower no. tract. No, it starts in the upper tract. That's the thing. It's where the ACE2 substance well, is, where right? where the virus comes in, right? Sure, Droplets sure. come in, you inhale them, they go to your upper tract nasopharynx, rep- right. they reproduce there, and then they go spread downwards. They don't sure. bypass all that and go right down. So. Although it's a good idea, that's where you should sample because every infection starts in the upper tract. I think the explanation for the the, the timing explanation makes sense and also yeah. the possibility that there are differences in individual immune responses. Yeah. And she may have just had a very robust early response that shut the virus down fast enough that it wasn't detectable anymore, but her immune system was still giving her the symptoms, which is really what gives you most of the symptoms anyway. Um, And then post all that, sure, she had antibodies because her immune system was on top of it. So, right. uh, But the the point, um, the point of the article really is, you know, testing is not perfect. So there's another virus, not this virus, but another virus, as I recall from our other podcast, obviously, in history, that infects the lower respiratory tract first because there's a certain configuration of sugar that the yes. virus binds to. It's H1N5. N so, H5N1. H5N1. Sorry, Very H5N1. good, Dixon. Very, Very good. good. And so that that's an example of uh, why they locate where they do. Yes, and this it, is a the uh, theoretically this principle is completely right. sound that you right. can get yes. viruses that go low in the lungs and only low in the lungs Correct. and you never find those okay, with the nasal that's swab. Right. And that, that's good. why good. they didn't spread so far good because they go all the way right. down. Good point, Dixon. Yes, the receptors for H5N1 avian influenza viruses are only in the lower tract, although also by the way in the eye. Oops. They could start there and drain. You know, there's a duct, the lacrimal duct, yep. that goes oh, from sure. the eye to the Absolutely. nose, and then from there down into the tract. So, right. anyway, but you're right. That's a good point. Alan, could you take the next one, please? Sure. Joyce writes, hi, Vincent. I just wanted to make sure you saw this, which I just found out from the Hopkins update. Not quite $1, but $1, but $5 is not bad. And this is um, Abbott getting U.S. authorization for the $5 rapid um, SARS-CoV-2 antigen test. Um and quotes from Reuters, and they are. It's a fifth. This is a fifteen-minute um, antigen test. They're expecting to sell it for five dollars, and they're wrapping up production right now. And we have the the media link from Abbott. Um, and then I wrote uh, a bunch of stuff down yeah, here. Yeah, this is all. This is all you. I yeah. ranted. So, uh, I, ranted. I read. Uh, I read the details uh, on this test. Mm-hmm. So this uh, has a comes in the CLIA waived category. Yep. So that means that it can probably be performed at point of care. Only by point somebody, of care. Only point by, of care. Only point of care. By not somebody at home. With, yeah, this is not an right, at-home yes, kit. Right, okay. By somebody with uh, minimal training. Uh, it involves, uh, it's not a spit test. 
but it is a nasal swab. Right. Okay. Not a nasal pharyngeal swab. So that's not too much worse than picking your nose. Okay. And the way it works is they got a little, uh, as they say here, credit card size, size thing. And you apparently you stick some buffer in a well and mm-hmm. you take the swab and do the nasal swab and poke that up from the bottom and spin it around about three times. And that's what solubilizes the sample. And then it's a lateral flow immunoassay that must be colorimetric, uh, yep. rather than, yeah. rather than fluorescence because you, you don't need a, an apparatus to read it. So I think it's a good step. Uh, first of all, it's not at home. The FDA, actually, this is an emergency use authorization. The FDA said it has to be done by, you know, point of care, not at home. And it's not for asymptomatic people. This is for sick people. And um, it's um, five bucks, which is not cheap enough in my view. And then Abbott said, by the way, the card is very cool because it's going to make a pattern that you could then read on a cell phone on an app and transmit and all that stuff so it can be reported. That's that's all good. Um, Abbott says they're going to make $50 million a month. Not enough, bub. Not enough. This can't be just one company. This needs to be multiple companies. This is this is a great start, though. And um, the I think the reason for the um, the stipulation that this is not for asymptomatic cases is – this is an antigen-based test. It's not going to be um, sensitive to the level of the PCR. It's not going to be particularly sensitive at all. And I think they're they're expecting that if people are asymptomatic, they may just not have enough virus to trigger this. Yeah. And you certainly would not put a lot of stock in getting a negative test. On, you, no, you, know, you wouldn't no, go out no. and say, oh, no, I don't have the virus. I can no, test but this it. Okay, is this- a, the test we want, as you know, is not... For that, we want to test that we can screen all the kids in a school and say yes. you stay home today. And that's this yes. is not it. Well, it, this is the FDA. Get, it, it's getting in the right it's direction. It's getting close, but it's not it. It's not yeah. it. Mike Mina yesterday said this is not it. It's close, right. and it, r- multiple reasons. And one is that, F- as we'll see later, we have an email. FDA has an issue with testing asymptomatic people because that's not what they do. They test sick people to find out what's wrong with them, right? So uh, Mike Mina was saying we have to change their thinking. And it's going to take a while. And he would like to actually do a trial to show, uh, if you look at asymptomatic people, how does the RNA go and how does the antigen go? Can we make conclusions about these antigen tests? And he he thinks that's what they need to convince them. Uh, So when we talk to the lawyer, Denise? Esposito. 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 Um, She, if I recall correctly, talked about uh, a potential, at least, evolution in FDA thinking to distinguish between uh, diagnostic tests and screening tests. Okay, that's that's the kind of evolution that we need. Yes, Uh, we need we need to emphasize the need for screening. Yes, in fact, we're not. That was the big part of the conversation I had yesterday, and they they said we have to. Tell them it's for screening. It's not for diagnosis. This is for yes. screening. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, um, I mean, traditionally, FDA has regulated stuff where if you don't have symptoms, why are you testing, right? You know, or you don't have some indication for the yeah. test. Yeah. There's there's not really been a whole lot of stuff where you just test for the sake of testing. And here we have a virus that kind of breaks the usual mold and really, really do need to test the asymptomatic. Yeah, that's right. It's, it's almost as if uh, uh, it's, a, the, it's a distinction in philosophy between trying to find out whether an individual is at risk or whether there's a population at risk. Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, and, you know, the focus has been trying to figure out whether this individual uh, has an issue, whereas what we really need to know at this point, in particular with school starting and stuff, is whether a given population is at mm-hmm. risk. Yes, exactly. My last comment on this: the name of this is the Binax Now, Binax Now COVID nineteen antigen test. Uh oh! What the hell is a COVID nineteen <laughs> antigen, folks? <laughs> Come on! There's no such thing. There's a SARS-CoV-2 antigen, but maybe you don't think that SARS-CoV-2 is trademarky enough. I don't know. That's it. Yeah, it's COVID-19. Sound. It rolls off your tongue, COVID, yeah. doesn't it? It's <laughs> yeah. kind of like, like Kodak. You know, you think these 
people must have spent some time thinking about it. Well, and also you can text it on social media without constantly hitting the shift key in order to get to the, you know, <laughs> yeah, and two I hyphens agree. you've got to get in there. It's SARS-CoV-2 uh, is really, really a crummy. But it's right. It's not an, it's not a COVID antigen, right? No. Correct. And I think that, but I think also in the public's mind, the recognizable phenomenon is COVID. Yes. That's what's on everybody's yes. mind. I, I just wrote a, a chapter for World Book Encyclopedia on this virus, right? And they had made a draft and they called the virus COVID-19 throughout. I said, I'm not going to write this if you don't <laughs> agree to it. You say, oh, yes, no problem. No problem. I, they, I, I, I have to take a moment here since <laughs> you're talking about writing it. So I was invited this year by my old department. I've been retired for five years. I can't believe I'm still doing this stuff. Uh, they invited me to lead off their research conference this year and talk about coronavirus. And it's interesting because I've been thinking about coronavirus and the pandemic like uh, constantly for the, mm -hmm. ever since it started. But I don't have any materials and I'm not an expert or anything else. So what did I do? I wrote uh, Susan Weiss mm -hmm. and Matt Freeman and Jason McClellan. And yeah, I said, good. dudes. Send me some slides. I got nothing. And they sent me a blizzard of stuff Good. that I haven't sorted through yet, but I can't wait to sort through it. I feel like a kid in a candy shop. Isn't it wonderful? Rich, is, that's actually, got all that's these people kind of, out there. You're an historical figure now. Yes. No, that's <laughs> that's actually kind of my world as a science journalist. Oh, ah, okay. I don't know much, but I know who to call. Yeah. Oh. So, and then, and they know tons. And it's called uh, exactly Ghost, the Ghostbusters, right? Yeah. yeah. Ghostbusters. Dixon, Dixon, can you take the next yes, one, please? I can. Stacy, Stacy writes, I've listened to, to every episode since around episode 600, and I'm a huge fan. Several people have written in asking how they can combat the misinformation that's out there. I joined up with this campaign linked above, which is H, well, stronger organization slash about that seeks to do just that. I feel that at the very least, it may be something you could share with your listeners, if not partner with, to provide more avenues to counter the miasma of anti-think. Thanks for all you do, Stacy. Yeah, well, we can do that. This is an interesting organization, right? Trying to counter the spread of harmful misinformation about science, medicine, and vaccines. We do this by working with partner organizations Sharing correct information and arming people with ways to fight back. Come on, let's join. Let's link to them at least. Well, we'll certainly oh, link, yeah. but I think we could work with them in some way. We could. Uh, I'll you reach have out. the head of the show on, and, you know, come on. The head of uh, the organization. Yeah, exactly. Uh, interesting. They've got a lot of uh, partners here. Uh, her, uh, shots heard around the world. That's good. <laughs> Vaccine. Uh, Association for Immunization Managers. On and on. I recognize the immunization partnership. Um, yeah, this several is, others. It's great. They've got. Um, I, I was a little concerned on the the front page um, of the site where they they're talking about you know providing correct information, which we know now from quite a bit of research is not the best way to counter misinformation. Hmm. Um, but they have, uh, if you if you go to their the solution page, they they actually have some positive steps to take. Um, you know, report misinformation to the sites where you see it and. Also, also comment, um, just simple comments that can, that can help, um, straighten yeah. things out. And, and this looks like a good approach. All right. Thank you, Stacy. Yep. Charles writes, hello, Twivers. It's a nice day in Chapel Hill, 92 F 33 C low chance of rain. So now we have $5 point of care rapid testing for SARS-CoV-2 virus. He got it right. Look at yeah. that. I am an Good. IT I am an IT worker at a medical practice. All the workers here are essential for providing medical care. Now that rapid testing is available and at a cost that would not break the bank, that brings up the question who should be tested, how often, and who should pay. Personally, I think every essential worker, healthcare workers, teachers, grocery store workers, meat packers, many others should be tested every day. That is an expense that a lot of places cannot afford, even at five dollars per worker. Nor is it really fair. So I think the government should be paying for the tests. What do you think? I think you got it right. I think so. I agree. <laughs> what do you think? What do we think? <laughs> so can we do some back of the envelope math? Let's say it's five bucks a pop. 
it shouldn't be, it should be one, but let's say it's five bucks and you have how many essential workers in the U S do you think a hundred million? Well, that's the uh, third of the population. Are you kidding? No, is that too much? Not even close. Much that's probably, too much. Yeah. They, we probably have a lot fewer essential workers than that. Um, 50 actually, million, 10 million, uh, to, 10 me, to 15. Let's say, 15. let's say 10 million. All right. To make it easy. So now we're talking about $50 million a day. Day. If you want to test them every day. Right. Right. And right. the five dollars a test, by the way, is the cost of the test. That's what you pay Abbott to deliver the test to your door. It's not what you pay the healthcare worker who is required to administer. Yeah, the test. that's right. That's right. It's going to be more, right? It's going to be a little bit more, but you you can make some of that since it's a short test. You, I mean, there's there's an economy of scale. Once you hire a nurse to do this, um, yeah. then the, you've paid that and that person is going to be there all day doing these tests. So 50 million bucks a day is nothing compared to the trillions that have been already spent on recovery. This Period. is part of recovery. This should be done by the administration. Here's why it won't be, because it's admitting there's a problem and they don't want to do that. And that's getting in the way of taking care of people. You guys think it should be paid by the government, by the way? Absolutely. That's the Absolutely. only. That's the only way to get this done at scale. You bet. Uh, Rich, can you take? Uh, I'm, ju I'm just looking up here. The annual U.S. Uh, military budget is seven hundred and thirty-eight billion dollars. <laughs> okay, so what's uh? It's five fifty seven, million. A billion, a billion is a thousand million. Um, <laughs> Alan knows because so, that's his his bank account is right. No, yes, right. I have to do this calculation every time I make a withdrawal. <laughs> so it's uh, that's uh, two billion. The a last day. three jets I bought were just yeah. out. go ahead. Uh, two billion a day. Two billion what a day? Uh, dollars a day for the uh, military budget. Oh, the two billion a day we're spending for the military budget. per day. Right. Yeah. Uh, that's just the fuel for the jets. Well, I mean, no, that's that's look, just the daily expense. I, I understand it, that argument, but we've already spent trillions on recovery. We've yeah, given yeah. money to corporations, and most of it's gone to the owners, the the CEOs, and so forth, and enriched them ridiculous amount. And and it, a fraction Vincent, could go to pay for. Well, I know there's I, only one reason for anyone getting involved in politics, and that's to make money. Remember that. Okay. That's not I, a good I, reason. And I wasn't the first person to say that either. Rich, can you take uh, Wayne's, please? Uh, okay. I don't I get was, this one at all. So I this is I can't read a word of it. It's, it's I mean, in Korean. Can, can read the email, but uh, Wayne writes masks works and uh, gives a link that's in Korean, right? Yeah, yeah. It's in Korean. Uh, this is from South Korean news source. You might find it interesting. Your latest immunology podcast is very interesting. You contribute so much to uh, we lay folk who love science. I'm getting close to eighty. And all your podcasts keep my brain as well as worldview, uh, keep my brain as well as worldview flexible. Uh, best day, safe and grumpy, Wayne from Korea, I guess. Uh, Wakayama. Wakayama, Japan. Wakayama, Japan. I didn't know you were 80, Wayne. Oh, yeah. you rightly, you're right, like a 25 Good. year old. Good job. In a good way. Yes, of course. Um, I don't know what this is. It's all I can see is pictures of people not wearing masks, right? Right. There's a Starbucks and pictures of people not wearing masks, and um, the text is in Korean, and so I, I can't tell what, what any of that is. is about. Okay. Sorry. Sorry, Wayne. Uh, Alan, can you take the next one? Rachel writes, hi again. I have another question that will perhaps be close to some of your hearts as fellow New Jerseyans. Not me. Um <laughs> And, and not rich. I just saw this news that New Jersey is considering reopening gyms, albeit with restrictions on September 1st. I personally feel this is a very bad decision, even with the guidelines they have in place. I've been tweeting policymakers trying to get their attention. We live in New Jersey and have done such an amazing job flattening the curve over the last few months. But if we want schools to, to open, we really need to be making tough choices and gyms seem to be a bad choice. Much like choirs, which you've spoken about, gyms will be a prime location for heavy breathing. I also think group classes will be the beginning of complacency where people push and push their boundaries until it's as if there's no distancing at all. Am I overreacting? How do you Twivers feel about gyms reopening? And sends an article link. Um, and Vincent, you have some notes on this. So they're, they're not just reopening the gyms um, willy nilly. There are restrictions, 25% capacity. Um, they're not doing group classes and, Masks on, equipment six feet apart, 
uh, sign a waiver. Um, well, the waiver is probably more for legal protection of the gym than anything else. <laughs> and they're going to, they're going to have uh, guest logs. Um, I, I, I'm dealing with this locally too, because um, my local gym here in Western Massachusetts is actually now, I just got an email from them saying, come on in and work out. Right. And um, I, I, I think I've mentioned before, I really miss the gym. I've got some weights in the basement, but it's that you can't get a proper, I can't get a proper workout at home and I'm not going to buy a Stairmaster that, you know, try and cram it in somewhere. Um, so I'm really tempted, but I'm hesitant and I, and I know infection rates locally are very low. Odds are this is probably okay, but as as Rachel points out, the gym is a is a heavy breathing location, or at least it should be. <laughs> How would you feel if it cost you five dollars a day as a surcharge to get tested before you went in the gym? Well, that would be a bonus. They, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Go in, okay. So so then I can I know where to go to get the five dollar test. Um, there you go. I'm. Yeah. It's a good idea. You got to be tested before yeah. you walk in the yeah, door. Yeah, it might. Ha- I still personally would probably stay away from the gym. Um, yeah, I would too. Because just because I do, I do anyway. Well, I've no, stayed no, away no, from I the would, gym for quite a while. I, I, I would stay away from the gym against my urge to go to the gym. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, and you're uh, saying. And we we actually we have access to a to a, a local pool club, uh, like an outdoor pool, and they have similar. Mm. There's a cap on capacity and everything. Um, and we've been going there. My wife has been, she's an avid swimmer. Um, so she likes to go and swim for a mile. And I think she actually is out doing that now. Um, and that, you know, we had a discussion about, well, you know, how, what are the risks here? But I feel it's very different because it's outdoors. Mm -hmm. It's, um, you know, there's never anybody in the adjacent lane because they're limiting that and you're breathing into the chlorinated water and, Um, I think that's a much safer setting, an indoor gym where I'm on the elliptical machine, breathing out all my particles and, um, and I, I, I guess maybe working out with a mask on would help the viral spread, but I can't imagine doing my usual workout with a mask on and not feeling suffocated. So, well, Alan, some of the major league baseball players are playing with it. Uh, they're following playing through the games. They're po- following a completely different approach, though. They're bubbled. No, no, no. They're playing with a mask on. Are they? Yes. You're playing well, ba- baseball now. Not all no. of them. No, that's not, not all of them. Baseball, you know, that's, <laughs> that's not heavy breathing. It's an outdoor that's not sport. A sport. No. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, my, do. my my wife and I are uh, members of the local YMCA, and uh, in normal times we go every day and do something uh and we haven't been since this started and the rules now are similar very similar to this and of course we have a 15 percent test positivity rate in uh, texas which yes, doesn't do. bode well Whoa. i haven't i haven't heard uh wow. i haven't heard of any problems uh that come out of the mm. uh ymca but to me it's like it's almost just too much of a hassle okay it's it's not it, all the, the all those regulations and stuff for me make it not fun. Okay. Well, there's a point so, to them though, right? Oh there yeah, is. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. But uh, if the point to going to the gym was to have fun, yeah. And the only way uh, to go to the go. gym is to look, not have fun. Right. Then <laughs> the, look, yeah. this is not about people going to the gym having fun. I know you yeah. can deal without gym for a while, but yeah. it's an economic thing thing for the gym owners. And in New Jersey, many of them have remained open despite the governor closing them because they need to make money and he's gotten mad and fined them and so forth. So this is a back and forth and he's trying to accommodate them. Yes. And that's and why. I, and I, I appreciate that. And I um, I support intelligent policymaking where they reach these kinds of compromises and say, okay, you can, we'll let you open under these circumstances with these stipulations. Um, but at the same time, I would recommend that people not go. And and I, sitting in a position of relative privilege, we've kept up our membership at our local gym. Um, yeah. It happens to be the local JCC, so they're a good you know community organization that that does other things too. And when this whole thing started, they said, you know, if people want to suspend their membership, we'll honor that. And 
And we just kept, you know, we said, okay, we'll pay, even though we're not getting anything, because we want it to exist when this is all over. Um, so I would advise people who are able to do that to do that, but I, I'm not going back to the gym until so I take vaccinated. part of the, uh, so, so the governor of New Jersey has a public face mask rule. Okay. Mm -hmm. But, but people are not all wearing face masks in public. It's just not Fact. paid that attention. So I suspect that a lot of these rules in the health clubs are going to get just ignored. So for that reason, I don't think it's a good idea. Yeah. The only upside is the infection rate is less than a percent in New Jersey at the moment. Yes. And that's, that's the right. only good part but i don't think this works without testing i think you got to test people to know who's positive coming in and so i wouldn't do it it's the same with school reopenings you yep. know i understand why there's huge pressure to do this and i don't necessarily fault the policymakers who are trying to make that incredibly different difficult yeah. compromise but um massachusetts they're going to reopen <clears throat> initially all virtual and then they're going to go to, at least in our district, uh, a hybrid plan in October. And they sent out the, the registration form already. Do you want your kid to be in the hybrid, one of the two cohorts that, you know, goes Monday, Tuesday, and then yeah. it's virtual the rest of the time? Um, or do you want to be, you, do you want your kid to have all online? You had the option of being in cohort C and we signed up for all online because yep. that's yeah. how I feel about that's it. That's what I would do. Uh, Dixon, can you take... John's John is next. Right. Yeah. Hi all. I'm a junior at Marietta College and my school is about to finish up its second week of in-person classes. I have enjoyed listening to this podcast all summer and as well as watching the virology lectures. Today my school has announced its first positive case along with a quarantine for 13 other people. We are required to wear masks and most people have committed to that. However, certain groups a certain group, I think you meant to write, have been throwing parties on the weekends, uh, which we all know can easily contribute to only a few cases getting out of hand very quickly. I am a TA for a few intro bio classes this semester, and I believe if I put out bounties <laughs> for the underclassmen to have parties shut down, I believe this can contribute to controlling the spread before school as to shut mm -hmm. down again. I think you better hire a bodyguard if you do that. Yeah. Hope you are all staying healthy. Best, John. I don't think that's a great idea. No, you shouldn't become a target. Uh, you should. Uh, you know, this uh, the party thing is an issue. My son's school, uh, they had a there was a party and someone was there and it tested positive and they have to quarantine everybody who was at the party because that don't have parties. Come on, think about Vincent, this. Vincent, the entire University of North Carolina had to go to virtual because of that. Yeah, I understand. I, well, think I think those, the students responsible for those parties should be ejected from school. I, yes. I would take the stance that the students responsible for those parties may actually have saved more lives than the administrators responsible for reopening these schools. Because they caused them to get because closed? Because they caused – they everybody, everybody Point. saw this problem coming, okay? That's not just the virologists saying, oh, you really shouldn't reopen. I mean, this is – Colleges are in a completely different category from the public school, the K through 12 system, in that people are coming from everywhere. You've got a mass migration event going on in the middle of a pandemic so that people can get to campus, move into their on-campus housing. And these people we're talking about are 18 to 22 years old and they're out beginning their adult lives. And I certainly thinking back to my 18 year old self, um, I probably would have been at the party. I'm sorry. It just, you know, that's, that's the wiring at that point. Um, and y this should not have been an issue. This should not have come up. They should have gone all virtual, but the universities didn't want to do that because they felt it was a threat to their, their business model. Uh, Dixon, speaking of universities, something's going on with Notre Dame. Uh, and right. I, I tried You're to right. look it up now, but it messes up my bandwidth. You know what's going on there? No, but they've had a lot of positive uh, uh, cases in the football team. And um, I don't know. They want to reopen school. They want it to be open so that everybody can go to school because it's a, it's yeah. a, okay. it's a big <laughs> dormitory uh, type of situation. A lot of people come from all over the country yeah. to go to school there. So. 
All right. The next one is from Robin. Good day, all. Further to your discussion on climate change during TWIV 654, I thought you might enjoy the following little comment. World. There is no way we can shut everything down in order to lower emissions, slow climate change, and protect the environment. Mother Nature. Here's a virus. Practice. <laughs> Cheers, Robin from Adelaide, COVID-free South Australia, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, hopefully is right. <laughs> that greeting is good day. Good day. Yes. Good day. Good day. Good day. I think good that's eye. close. Good day. I think we have good a uh, rich. Good next eye. one is also from Robin. <laughs> oh. Uh, hang on. Oh, yeah. Uh, good day. Oh. <laughs> Love listening. Very informative. I am from Adelaide, South Australia. Very cold and very dry. Very worrying. And supposedly the driest state in the driest inhabited con continent as we are caught in school, as we are taught in school. Two questions. <clears throat> Read Dr. Minna et al. Rapid Testing. I have tried and tried to get through to the Australian Health Department's reusing these tests, but I keep coming up against negativity. <clears throat> They don't seem to understand that sensitivity is not random, but depends on the amount of virus being shed. Or, alternatively, I get no answer, but I shall persist. However, one thing about the idea that a person is shedding up to three days prior to and up to three days after the onset of symptoms makes me wonder why so many frontline health workers get COVID-19. I would have thought that a person would not present to hospital until several days after onset if when they begin uh, to get ill enough to require hospitalization, and by then, they wouldn't be shedding. I say this because in Victoria, there was a uh, stuff up in quarantine, and the virus escaped. Very many nurses and doctors have become COVID-19 positive. And another unrelated question, how did the Spanish flu die out? And is it possible that COVID-19 will come to a natural end? And if so, hopefully earlier rather than later. Okay. So uh, just because you can be shedding virus before you're symptomatic doesn't mean that you're not shedding it after you're symptomatic. Mm -hmm. People who land in the hospital are still, a lot of them are still shedding virus and probably a lot of virus for a long time. And it's remarkable that Daniel is, and several others like him, get sure. through this without getting sick. Good I mean, use it's of incredible. PPE. Yes. Incredible. Rigorous. Yeah. Uh, and the Spanish flu, uh, I don't know the full answer to that. Part of it is herd immunity. Uh, part of it is I uh, seasonality. Seasonality. Uh, seasonality. Um, I mean, we and, asked Adam, and he said herd immunity, but I, I looked at a very recent review article. Uh, they didn't even talk about it. Right. I don't think we really know. Uh, COVID-19 um, could come to a natural end for reasons that we have discussed. Herd immunity, basically. And understand that herd immunity doesn't mean that the virus is going away. It means that we have sufficient immunity as a population so that we're no longer getting sick. So that's, and why, you may said, get that's why you said COVID. You picked your words very carefully. So SARS-CoV-1 uh, uh, <laughs> did die out and nobody understood why. I understand why. Oh, yeah. You? Yeah. It why? didn't spread we, well. It didn't spread well. And most of the transmission occurred after the peak of disease when most people were in the hospital. And there you could, right. oh, you, okay. could you could figure out who was sick in quarantine. Yeah, so that, that was contained. Early. Okay. 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 Uh, uh, so, so yes, so, yeah. I, I believe I believe the COVID nineteen disease could come to a natural end. I agree I through agree. population uh, immunity. Uh, when I don't know, that could take a couple of years. Um, it could take a couple think, of years, and that would be a horrifying way to get there. Yeah, that is the worst possible outcome for this because what we mean when we say herd immunity is that everybody eventually gets exposed to it and everybody who's likely to die of this ends up dying of this, which is going to be a lot of people. And so, uh, you know, we haven't talked about for a long time, we haven't talked about infection fatality rate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and I don't really know what it is. I, my, my sense is that it's somewhere between maybe 0.5 and 1%. 
It's if you look at the case yeah. fatality all, rate, all the numbers seem to converge. What's one percent of seven billion? Exactly. Uh, though. exactly. Yeah, uh, so seventy Se- million. Seventy million people. So that's how many people would have to die for this to just go through and infect and make a herd immunity. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, in the U.S., that'd be three and a half million people. Yeah. Oh, hopefully we get a vaccine that's going to prevent that, right? Yes. Right. Yeah. That's what we're hoping. Alan, you're next. Okay. Um, Andy writes, let's say we're in the world before smoke detectors and there are two new technologies ready for production. One senses any amount of smoke particles and goes off when you make toast. And if you have a small kitchen fire, we'll keep going for two weeks after you extinguish it until every particle is gone. But it takes the detector 20 minutes to register the smoke and start beeping. That detector costs $50,000. Then let's say there's another detector that isn't sensitive enough to pick up burning toast, but will pick up an actual fire 98% of the time and then stop ringing a few minutes after you get the fire out. It would cost $25. Now imagine you lived in a giant apartment building in New York City next to a lot of other giant apartment buildings. Do you think the second detector should be outlawed because it's less sensitive than the first? Or instead, do you think that every apartment should have to have it, knowing that even if one didn't work and a family died, it's unlikely the rest of the building it's it's likely the rest of the building would be saved. Well, this is exactly what's happening with US COVID-19 testing. Fa- fast, highly accurate uh, when contagious tests could be made for a dollar, but they're illegal because they are considered not as good as the incredibly expensive PCR tests that continue to ring two weeks after the fire is out and return results after the fire has engulfed the neighboring apartment. Yeah, it's great. Well, that's a beautiful out. analogy. Yes, I, like I love it. it. It's perfect. Uh, I would like the twenty-five dollar detector. Yes, I'll take. Yeah, the I'll go for the twenty-five dollar one. Yeah, but I, I think eventually we're going to get around to this. Uh, yes, but just taking time. D- Dixon, can you take the next one? I can. Andy, I uh, know Jim writes. Hello, Twivers. I'm enrolled in the Moderna Stage Three clinical trials and just got my first shot today. Holy cow, my arm hurts way worse than any previous flu shot. I also have a headache, swelling under my armpit. And just don't feel quite right. (laughs) I'm not thinking any saline injection would give me this severe of a response. So just hypothetically, if I wanted to see if I developed antibodies, how long would I need to wait before getting serologically tested? Four weeks, two weeks after the booster injection? And I'm not saying I would unblind a double-blinded phase three vaccine candidate clinical trial by signing up (laughs) my own test at LabCorp, but (laughs) I was just curious. A a friend of mine wants to know, I'm sure. Keep up the good work, Jim. So, Do you think uh, when you sign the agreement, they say you shouldn't go get tested in it? They ought to. They should, right? Well, yeah, yeah, because then you're obviously revealed. But I think you should wait two to four weeks. But probably after all of the this booster. will appear on that little insert that you yeah. get for the <laughs> at least two weeks. And yeah. Vincent, you you checked on this, and the placebo is saline. Yeah, I wanted to make sure it was uh, saline. Yeah, it's normal saline because sometimes they do other vaccines. Yeah, they'll placebo, do. Right? I know. In I thought in earlier trials they tested some other some unrelated vaccine to make sure yeah. that just generally yes. using. The I think that would, that may have been in the uh, Oxford uh, vaccine. Yes. I'm not right. sure. Yes. One That's of them. Right. And Oxford. they used a yeah. pneumococcal vaccine. Right. I think it's a good idea because yeah. things that like this, a, right? Cause these, well, things like things like this. And also because there is some evidence that just any vaccine might have some protective effect. And if you're, if you're really trying to get an answer on a specific vaccine that you don't want to control against plain saline, yeah, because it could be that just any kind of boost to the immune system will provide some temporary protection. Let me, let me ask you, you what you think. So th- let's say this Moderna vaccine this is make looks like it's making uh, neutralizing antibodies and T cells. I'm suspecting it's going to give some kind of protection. I don't know what percent. How, do you think it'll be durable? Do you think it'll last a year or two, or do you think it'll be shorter lived? Just speculation. Well, how do you define protection? Protection uh, against disease. And I'm not talking disease. about not infection, disease. Well, even if it does protect against disease, what if it just eliminates all fatalities? Yeah, well, right. Yeah, that's the fine. question. How that's long fine. How long do you think that that'll last. Protective, whatever level of protection it provides will last? Just curious what you're thinking. I mean, if you don't have a thought, that's fine. Uh, I don't, uh, I don't really know enough. I'm thinking, I'm thinking it's going to decay. Okay. It's because my understanding, okay. So uh, this is a pretty rudimentary understanding. It goes back to 
uh, studying and lecturing about the uh, human papillomavirus vaccine. Because mm. uh, that gives, uh, I went through a period of time where I had to do some sort of extra literature work on this. And I had a lot of correspondence with John Schiller, uh, who was, uh, he, well, once again, there's another example of somebody who was enormously helpful and forthcoming uh, with his knowledge. And uh, he said that, that that vaccine has an extraordinarily durable antibody response, okay, yeah, yeah. that, that, uh, that uh, sent all the immunologists, uh, you know, they were all really surprised because they expected uh, a, a response to uh, what is uh, just a, well, just a protein antigen, but it's a virus-like particle, so that's a little different. Yeah. They expected, based on experience, that response to a protein antigen would wane over time. But this is different than that because this is an antigen made on site, okay? Uh, and so I I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. What do you think, Alan? 24 months. <laughs> yeah. Wow. I, I think it's wow. an interesting question. Here's the way I look <laughs> you want, at it. Yeah, I mean, that's uh, <laughs> fine. That's fine. Um, I think I, that's optimistic. I just pulled that number out. <laughs> yeah, so here's how I'm looking at it. So and the winner is? <laughs> the... Um, and by the way, Rich, the Shingrix vaccine, the new shingles vaccine, which is just glycoprotein, adjuvant right. glycoprotein, it gives you almost 100% protection against infection. I just don't know how durable it is. That'll be interesting to see. But sometimes the, the adjuvant is what gives you the long-lasting memory. Anyway, I'm thinking for these – so for the coronas, it looks like natural infection doesn't even – doesn't give you durable immunity, at least – in terms of antibodies against disease, it, it gives you a durable immunity against disease, but not against infection. So it's right. a natural component. And I'm wondering if that's a, a, a feature of the antigen or something that's made by the virus, yeah. viral protein, that's tickling, that's tweaking with the, the memory response, right? Right. So you could argue that then if you just have a spike protein, you're not going to have any of that messing around and it should be fine. On the other hand, is it adjuvanted? I guess you could argue that the lipid nanoparticle is an adjuvant, right? Uh, I think, uh, to me, to me, the fact, the very fact that it's uh, synthesized on site uh, is uh, effectively an adjuvant. You mean like, okay. here, right? Uh, in your cells, that in it's actually cells. being, yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Right. And for a less facetious answer, I, I kind of think that it's going to be protective that that you that kind of protection would have some kind of carry over at 24 months i don't know about that but um I, I think it might be the case where three four years down the the road you get a cold you know and you just, eh, don't feel so great but you're not in the hospital on a ventilator or anything just like eh, <laughs> okay over um so i i think there will be some some lasting effect of a, of a vaccine that'll be yeah hopefully protective enough now we've got different times we have different kinds of vaccines besides the moderna yes. obviously yes. so they're moderna gonna have all well, some of them yes. are replicating and so forth so but the, the, what i'm thinking of the, the a very nice paper came out from rafia meds group recently which shows that the inactivated flu vaccine which is non-adjuvanted just inactivated particles injected im after a year there are no more memory b cells left so I asked, I wrote John Udell, I said, why? He said, well, it could be just the lack of adjuvant could do that. We don't know. We haven't looked at it. So I'm wondering what, you know, the, that's why I said the Shingrix is really good, but I don't know how long it lasts. Right. It is adjuvanted. <clears throat> right. I, I have all the same thing as you, Vincent. And, uh, you know, it emphasizes that among other things, these are new technologies. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And we're going to get the data, uh, will, which is sure. really fascinating. We'll find out. And not only that, but we're going to talk about it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm looking forward to that. I can't wait. Anthony writes, uh, might the success of the New York, New Jersey containment have been due to the weather? Will that unravel with the summer's end? I think not. I think the success was due to containment, physical, non-pharmaceutical measures, um, and a certain amount of immunity because we had some communities with very high infection rates. I had thought at the beginning of the spring that maybe weather would play in, but it didn't. And in very, very hot places <laughs> like Texas, the virus ripped through. So I don't think there's – when the population immunity is so low, I don't think that uh, seasonality really plays any role. 
Yeah, and uh, in consistently hot places like Brazil um, and the Philippines, I'm, there's well, I, I haven't seen any evidence that seasonality is going to save us with this. No. Uh, this brings up a, uh, an update on the <clears throat> um, local situation. Uh, we are still on the decline here in the Austin Metropolitan Statistical Area. We're down to a seven-day moving average of 19 cases, uh, which is good for us. And uh, I have to say that the experiment, if you want to call it that here locally, is, a, I think, a wonderful demonstration of how behavior influences uh, the caseload locally because they're, sure. they're absolutely correlated. University of Texas is going to be all virtual this year? Um, you know, I don't know the details. Uh, no, there are students who are have come back. Students have come back to campus. I don't know about all of them. I know that virtual is an option. Uh, I don't know that it's always an option. I believe that there are, I think it's kind of a hybrid model. Uh, and certainly that's the case at Texas State, uh, my daughter's school. People have come back to campus. Uh, there are some all online. There are some face-to-face -face classes. There are some hybrid classes. And there is, uh, they have plans in place. I don't know exactly what the trigger is, uh, but they can uh, go all online pretty easily. If you Relative say that in Texas, trigger, I, I, I would not yes. use that phrase. I would use another phrase. Yes. <laughs> yeah, Rich, can you take, I think we're up to Christian. Christian, yes. yes. Christian writes, hello, Twiv. Thank you for being my rock in an ocean of misinformation and outright lies. <laughs> Even though some of the stuff goes over my head, I'm trying and learning. Keep trying, you will learn. <clears throat> it's, you know. A lot of it's just vocabulary. It's okay. <laughs> uh, I'm not any kind of scientist. Yes, you are. You just don't know it. Yes. But I have been running a larger company with the use of common sense. That's science. You are a scientist. Uh, for many years with what I consider a fairly good result. So being a common sensiologist, mm -hmm. I have a couple of questions. First of all, in Denmark, we do not wear masks other than in public transportation. The reason behind uh, that is that according to the authorities, we're not having enough infected people to do so when shopping and similar. So the logic should be, we'll wait until we have enough people infected, then we'll mask up. Does that sound like something you would recommend? No. no. I think you're common sensiology is right on the money second i have just seen a video with a professor from yale school of public health dr harvey risch who is in favor of hydroxychloroquine and says tens of thousands are dying unnecessarily due to politics as politics are keeping patients from getting the right treatment hydroxychloroquine what is your opinion on that? Best that regards. Is crap. <laughs> so, uh, what, yeah. crap. what do you really think, Dixon? Uh, double crap. <laughs> so, I've looked into this uh, previously. I've looked into this. Uh, uh, Who is that guy? He's an epidemiologist. Is he? Okay. Yes. Of he, some he, doesn't, repute. he doesn't read. No. He is an epidemiologist of some repute who is has done his own sort of meta analysis of the situation and come to the conclusion that hydroxychloroquine works. But the placebo controlled trials, none of, I loved Anthony Fauci's congressional testimony. If you ever <laughs> saw that, it was great. Okay. Because there was a, there was a congressman who was trying to nail him on uh, the Michigan study that came out from the Ford <clears throat> Mm -hmm. complex of yeah. hospitals, hospitals okay yeah. correct that was a uh that was an observational study that came to the conclusion that hyd hydroxychloroquine worked and the congressman is saying but it's peer-reviewed it's peer-reviewed and tony says i don't care 
<laughs> it could still be wrong. Yes. He said, and he pointed out the problems with the observational study. In that particular case, one of many problems was that the people on hydroxychloroquine were getting a different standard of care, really, that commonly included steroids, yeah. Yeah. Uh, which are known to be beneficial. And Tony said, look, all of the placebo-controlled trials that have been done, which is the gold standard for testing, uh, and and uh, there are uh, more than a few. None of them have shown any benefit from hydro hydroxychloroquine. And so in the absence of that sort of evidence, uh, I'm not buying it. And he said, he added, he said, when somebody comes up with a properly controlled study that shows that it has benefit under a certain set of circumstances, I'll be the first. Okay. Right. To right. tout that as an effective therapy, but you got to show me the data. That's right. The it's anode never, data. It's never going to happen because in my, opinion, there, right? it doesn't work. <laughs> in my opinion, in lung cells from humans, the drug does not inhibit virus replication because it's, the wrong protease is in the other cells, viral cells that everyone had been trying before. So there's just no way this can work. It doesn't inhibit in lung cells. It this doesn't is inhibit. one of those things. It got started because of an in vitro finding. Right. Mm -hmm. And then some clinicians latched onto it and said, aha, a drug. And then some politicians latched onto it and said, aha, a reelection. And <laughs> that's right. And the, it, it all got rolling based on a finding in, as Vincent says, the wrong cells. Um, and here we are. And now you have to now it's like you have to prove that it doesn't work which is exactly the wrong way to look at the whole situation. Right. Um, no, there's no evidence that this works in actual people. And it's interesting when you uh, point out, Alan, that uh, early on physicians latched onto it and started using it. It reminds me of, you know, Daniel's description of how the standard of care uh, and the quality of care for COVID patients mm -hmm. has evolved. Yes. And he talks repeatedly about how initially people threw everything they could think of at them. Because they didn't sink. know what would work. And That's over right. time, they've kind of figured out what doesn't work. And, you know, we're probably in the initial stages, in many cases, doing more harm than good. Yeah. Uh, and in, in sometimes, in some cases, less is more. <laughs> uh, Alan, you are next. Okay. Uh, John writes, dear Twiv team, I'm less than an hour from you. Um, so my temperature, yeah, I guess it's Vincent probably. So my temperature, even in Kelvin or Rankine, is pretty much the same as yours. Heck, it's even going to be the same in Réamu. <laughs> oh, which I don't think anyone has discussed yet. Okay, fine. It's 24 <laughs> Réamu. I was actually a French major in college. They didn't teach that there either, come to think of it. Um, can somebody look out? I'm, I'm, I'm on it. He's on. So it's apparently got very large. It's apparently a Celsius-like... Don't forget the standards. accent, Mark. Oh, R E with the the accent. What is that aigu? Um, uh, so the uh, the Remur scale is a temperature scale for which the freezing and boiling points of water are defined defined as zero and eighty degrees, respectively. <laughs> the scale is named for uh, Rene Antoine uh, Ferchot de Remur who first proposed a similar scale in 1730. And I don't think you want to know why, uh, at least not right now. <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> however, I'll say one mandatory thing. I'm just a Wall Street analyst portfolio manager doing mostly healthcare and a proud Patreon supporter. Thank you very much. And as many of my colleagues and competitors have MDs and PhDs, I've had to get a halfway decent grounding in the science to be able to keep up. TWIV is one of my non-secret weapons, which I recommend to everyone, and I've taken a few online classes on top of what I'm learning here, which is something new twice a week, and yes, the non-COVID episodes too. And by the way, Rich, if you think that saying all models are wrong but some are useful is relevant in science, imagine how much more so they are in my business, which can occasionally look like a random number generator generating earnings estimates. I've been doing this 30 years, so I can say that and call it evidence-based. <laughs> <laughs> my uh, my son-in-law is an economist, and uh, every time I ask him a question, every answer is prefaced with, well, it depends. <laughs> it depends. 
Nice. E- economics is the field of extrapolating from a single point, I believe. Um, <laughs> so any, anyway, other people can talk about the science better than I can, though I've nearly written you several times before today. But today I was asked by someone what my thoughts are, were regarding the emergency use authorization for convalescent plasma. To which I responded, not wholly comfortable with its being approved yet, but totally understand its measured use and that it probably should be approved one day if the data come through. Heck, like Peter Hotez says, I'd want it for myself if the situation were correct. Uh, One, the emergency use authorization appeared to have been granted without mature data, which often happens for emergency use, but the plasma study was really immature, and the discussion of the patients for whom it worked was an exercise in data mining that a second semester statistics student would have recognized. Should be first semester, but they waste half your time in coin flips. (laughs) Docs are already, a second, docs are already dispensing, but being very careful this may make them prescribe it to patients who should not have ha- have it because they will have the ethical dilemma of wondering whether they're withholding life-saving treatment as discussed in a re- recent episode of TWIV. Well, I'm trying. Um, three FDA themselves said it does not represent a new standard of care, hardly a ringing endorsement. The significant issue from my perspective is this, if FDA bowed to political pressure and may need to do so again and again, and I spend a huge amount of my time sifting through scientific literature and statistical studies to understand what's going on with development stage companies whose continued existence depends on the ability to bring to market their first product, what happens if FDA loses credibility? If I can't trust the agency, and I thought Scott Gottlieb was a superb commissioner, so this isn't a partisan political issue on my part then neither can anyone else in my world or yours. That, as we say professionally, would be something of a sandwich. By the way, if the perspective of someone with 30 years experience in my own field is ever of use to you, I'd only be too happy to provide it either online or off. Uh, Yes, I can also rant and yell and be generally grumpy with the pros. It's an occupational hazard. And do please keep up the extraordinary work you do in the labs, the classrooms, and the podcasts. Keep on twiving. And there's a postscript. Before you do that, that's a great point that we are, we've said already, we're having trouble trusting CDC. Yes. And if you can't trust FDA, you know, these companies, you know, that depend yeah. on, what are you going to do? Then the people like John, who is an analyst, what is, who are you going to pay attention to? Yeah. I am hoping that all this will be righted in due course. Yes. Oh. And and for a lot of, I, I talk to yeah, people yeah. at biotech and pharma companies frequently, um, and I haven't brought up this specific subject, but yeah, trust in the FDA is a critical. Absolutely. It's a cornerstone of a major part of the economy, and that is now being <clears throat> undermined. Um, postscript, uh, John says his wife had the classic symptoms of COVID-19 in March, um, she tested negative and rheumatologist told her um, was going to consider it probable COVID regardless because the signs and symptoms overrode what was still a test with relatively low sensitivity and long lag time. She tested positive for antibodies last week, five months later. Um, and the doctor said it was unusual that the IgG would have that degree of persistence, but that it speaks for itself. I have to admit it um, I felt it incumbent on me to suggest I'm sure she's right, but you could also have had terrible bronchitis in March and asymptomatic COVID in June. <laughs> that made me briefly unpopular. <laughs> the sacrifices we make. Very good. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Very good. Very good thinking. Good yeah. thinking. Yes, that is that is a totally valid point, John, <laughs> that I would be similarly unpopular for making if it came up in my house. I also think that the doc's uh, reaction that after five uh, months, uh, he's surprised that she'd have that much uh, degree of persistence. I think that's, I don't see, I don't know where he's getting that. No, I'm not, I'm there's not, not enough data. Nope. Yeah. Uh, PPS. So I got an antibody test yesterday, <laughs> came back at 9.2 AU per mil, which the test calls negative, but which it was suggested might more appropriately be called no longer positive <laughs> as negative readings in this test seem to be far lower than this. So I was wondering if there's a spare T cell assay available. Uh, I guess my result means I deserve that momentary unpopularity as one might suggest I could easily have been the first one in the household to get it. And unfortunately there aren't any uh, easily doable T cell assays, right? Yeah. Commercially available. Not, not like there are uh, antibody assays available, right? There should be, I guess. 
Sure. So, but you'd have to figure out how to interpret them. You'd have to figure out how to do that in a in a yeah. Right. Thank uh, you, John is an John is an hour from us, meaning he's an hour from Brianne, you know, or closer. Maybe right. you ought to go, you know, get Brianne to draw some blood. I don't know if she can, she I don't know if she can do the test though. Probably could. Not sure she'd want to. Right. All right, let's do one more, Point. Dixon. Shannon writes, "Why settle for a rat rapid antigen test when you can have a heart?" Home everyday antigen rapid test. Names are important. When we're trying to contact our representatives and other government workers to make a change, we need them to be able to connect all the message back to one name. Since the rolling out of the rapid antigen tests, rats, that are still tied to machines and or specific locations, it has been harder to find the words to promote the desirable home tests. We need to use an easily identifiable name that can instantly be recognized. My family and I were discussing this over dinner. On the radio or in news articles, it is hard to understand which test is being discussed right away. We need a name that everyone recognizes without a long list of distinguishing qualities. I recommend Heart, Home Everyday Antigen Rapid Test. It has a great poster slash po post potential. Hearts for teachers, hearts for essential workers. Everyone needs a heart. Hearts include everyone. Why settle for a rat when you can have a heart? Hearts for our schools. We wanted help. They gave us a rat. Now we want a heart. And they still gave us a rat. <laughs> What do you think about that? <laughs> Thank you, Sharon. Nice, hey, very good. So Sharon must be in mark. Shannon must be in marketing. Marketing. If she's not. She's missing a grand opportunity. I think <laughs> Shannon is should true. be in marketing. Yeah, so true. I like everyone needs a heart for a title. Yeah, I, I do too. Oh, I've already pasted it up there. Bingo, okay, bingo, bingo. All right. <clears throat> wow, we have more to go. Uh, not too much more though. Uh, that brings us to the end of another episode of TWIV. This would be 658. You can find show notes at microbe.tv slash TWIV. It's where you'll find the full text of the letters, links to articles we talk about. If you have more questions, send them to TWIV at microbe.tv. And if you would like to help us financially, microbe.tv slash contribute. You know, you go there, you'll see you can use Patreon or PayPal to give us money, but you can also go to cafepress.com slash TWIV and buy merch. And a lot of you are doing that to an amazing number. And I'm expecting to see you on the street one day because there's so many of you buying these things. You got to be wearing them. Shirts, t-shirts, hats, mugs, uh, face masks. I love it. I love it. And I'm thinking, you know, years ago I had this idea. I should make this stuff and nobody bought it until <laughs> pandemic. <laughs> It's very funny. All right. Microbe.tv slash contribute. Dixon de Pommier is at trichinella.org and the livingriver.com. Thank you, Dixon. It was a good time. This was fun. Lots of fun. Rich Condit's an emeritus professor, University of Florida, Gainesville, currently residing in Austin, Texas. Thank you, Rich. Sure enough. Always a good time. Alan Dove's at turbidplaque.com on Twitter. He's Alan Dove. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.blog. I'd like to thank the American Society for Virology and the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV and Ronald Jenkins for the music. This episode of TWIV was recorded, edited, and posted by me, Vincent Racaniello. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral.